Okay, we are call our meeting to order. And we will start with our Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Sugars, can you call the roll, please? Mrs. Stratton. Here. Mrs. Fleischer. Here. Mrs. Gallagher. Here. Mr. Greenbaum. Here. Mr. Mayor. Here. Dr. Rood. Mrs. Tong. Here. Mrs. Winters. Here. Ms. Stern. Here. Okay. We will start with, uh, normally we have board recognition, but we don't have any tonight. Um, we also normally have presentations. We don't have any tonight. And normally we have administrative reports and lo and behold, no, drum roll, no administrative reports. So that means that we move on to correspondence. Do any board members have correspondence? Breaking the record here, Mr. Greenbaum, we have something to add, go for it. Thank you. So uh, I thought I would start today with a uh, bond construction update. Um, Lots of good stuff going on, nothing too exciting, and no excitement is usually good news. <laughs> I've been assured if nothing is going wrong, it will, and it will be addressed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've had some incidents, and they have handled it very well. Um, so first off, with roofing contracts, all jobs have reached the substantial completion phase. There are a few punch list items for each contractor and final inspection with the township being scheduled are, or are already completed and lots of closeout documents with warranties to be completed as well. Uh, we even had contractors yielded some costs back to the district uh, after some incidents and I'm sorry, after some incidentals during construction. Uh, and as was mentioned last week, or three weeks ago, whenever it was. Um, there's a change order within that was within the allowance, so we're going to have some monies refunded from that. Uh, the stadium at East, there's a construction meeting this week, and work has already begun. The permit was received last Tuesday. Uh, the contractor is currently installing stadium lights, and work on the lighting should be completed in the next two weeks, with work to continue and expected to be completed before the first game in the spring. Uh, various site improvements, uh, Melberg site and access accessibility projects have reached substantial completion. Uh, they're currently working on a couple minor punch list items. Um, site work at Bret Hart, particularly the playground is finished. The slide is has been replaced and the playground is full again. Uh, and paving behind pain uh, is completed uh, with some minor drainage issues to be addressed in the spring. Uh, still waiting for handrail fabrication. And at Stockton and Lewis, they've reached substantial completion with site work and currently going through uh, operational program for the new lights in the parking lot. Uh, APRs are the newest thing going on. Um, as we've talked about, uh, we had a, a successful bid. Um, there's a cordial meeting that was held with township code officials to get the permits. Construction fencing is up at all six sites with appropriate signage. Uh, site clearing is currently underway at Kingston, and that'll be done sequentially one at a time. So you'll see uh, clearing of the site go from one school to the next in an order I did not write down, but they'll all happen. Uh, and there's some remaining procurement work uh, for things like theater, theater sound and lighting, playground equipment. Um, and anticipated completion once again is May of 2025. A couple other highlights, Carusi is currently in the design phase. There's a lot of work that's gonna be done there. Uh, working directly with the principal and associated staff to look at the, uh, look at the curriculum, determine uh, what certain spaces need to be, such as the science, science lab and how to configure it. Uh, and work is expected to ramp up in February. Uh, temporary classroom units uh, will be needed in 2025, 26, and 27. And we are starting to see new companies uh, coming in wanting to offer their services. So hopefully we have some competitive bids for 11 to 13 classrooms. Uh, let's see. 
I think lastly, we have early childhood, our preschool expansion. Uh, we have two additions plus restrooms. We'll be voting on that tonight for accepting ROD grants. Um, there were designs provided to uh, provided by Mr. Garrison that was uh, that were selected uh, that align with the needs of the building. Lots of cubbies and storage. The new bathrooms will be built on an outside wall to minimize disruption to interior spaces. Uh, these will all be done under one big bid package. Uh, and it looks like the cost matched the estimates that we originally looked at. And we still need to go to the planning board, so no specific dates yet. Uh, but once work starts, it's expected to be completed within about 18 months of the start date. So stay tuned for that. Hopefully we'll have that sooner than later and can fill some more seats. I think that's it for construction update. Um, the other thing I'll mention briefly, over the weekend, my family went to see High School West production of A Christmas Story. Uh, it was an amazing performance by our talented stu students. We really enjoyed it. Um, ran into fellow board members, Dr. Morton, um, as well as a uh, past board member, some friends from Chisepta. And it was just nice to see everybody and everyone seemed to enjoy the show. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Great updates. Appreciate them. Other board member correspondence. Christmas story. <laughs> I also went to a Christmas story. It was fabulous. I actually got to be there double duty. I was there as a parent, but also as a very proud Girl Scout leader because two of my girls in my Girl Scout troop were in the children's ensemble, which is really neat. I love that West does that and includes our younger students. They can see the future of what trauma will be like when they get to West. Thank you. And we did have the preschool town hall. I don't know if you'd like to report on that, Mrs. Winters, a little bit since you let it. I think that is in the CNI report. So I'll do it at that point. Perfect. If that's okay, Mr. Stern. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yep, that's on our agenda for later. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other board member correspondence? Okay. So we go to our first public comment. There will be two opportunities for public comment this evening. The first public comment session is for board action items only, items 17 through 20. There will be another public comment uh, time at the end of our meeting for any school-related topic. If you are a student in the district, you may comment on any agenda item during the first public comment period. If you are a student and you are online, please identify yourself with an S at the name of your uh, after at the end of your name, so that we know that you are a student and we can call on you before the um, non-students. Uh, if you'd like to speak now, please identify uh, the agenda item you're speaking about. Also, please state your name and municipality at the beginning. We will alternate between speakers in the room and those who are online. Each speaker will be given a maximum of three minutes to speak, and the timer on the screen will indicate how much time you have. Public comment is an opportunity for the members of the community to comment on matters relevant to the operations of Cherry Hill Public School District or within the authority of the Cherry Hill Board of Education. The board welcomes diverse opinions on relevant matters. Under established federal law governing reasonable restrictions on speech in public forums, statements which demean individual community members or groups or which are irrelevant to the operations of the school district or are repetitious will not be permitted. Community members who would like to present information not relevant to the school district are always welcome to communicate directly to the district superintendent, board president, and all board members via email or other alternative means. And with that, we will start in the room. If there's anyone who would like to speak on a board action item, to, or if you are a student and you'd like to speak, please approach the podium now. I think you know the drill, so I'll let you get going. Laurie Neary, Cherry Hill. I am speaking on item 18.2, resolution of eligible cost determinations. I wanted to know if this is for the preschool construction, and if so, do we not have to show the state approval of our 60% of that share? And what is the cost? And if so, did we already approve this under a prior action? Because um, I don't, I don't recall seeing our portion of the cost for the preschool construction. So I just wanted to know if I could get some information on that. Thank you. Okay, and now we go to the line, and the first hand up uh, ends with the phone number seven eight eight. You please state your name, your municipality, and the item you are speaking on. My name is Jeff Potterwitz. 
live in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Uh, 14.2-2270, religion in schools. Please vote no to the revisions made to this policy at this time. At this time, the statement made that I'm the sorry, board... I'm sorry, that's not an agenda item, so if you could um, please call back during a second public comment. Okay, is there anybody who'd like to speak in the room on our action item agendas, uh, action items? Okay, so we go to Laura Ann's iPad. If you could please state your full name, your municipality on the line, and the action item you're speaking on. It's Ann Einhorn, 19.2. The letter of resignation that Mrs. Cohen from the superintendent's office has submitted that will become active at the end of the school year. I'd like to thank Janet. Um, she's probably one of the best superintendent secretaries, which is what we called them in the old days, um, that I have ever met in my life. Um, I do believe that policy and planning is going to miss her greatly because Janet is not only detail oriented, but thorough and effective. And what I really appreciate about Janet is that as people slowly resign from our district, that there is a sense of history and knowledge that cannot be repeated in a new employee. Um, and contrary to public opinion, at times history is a very important part of our process as a school district moving forward. So Janet, I thank you. Um, you've been through the ups and downs of the school district and I appreciate you, but I certainly wish you well in your next endeavors. Thank you. Okay, we go back to the room. If anybody else would like to speak about an action item, you approach the podium. We don't have anybody in the room. Then we go to the line and it's a phone number that ends with 891. If you could please state your name, municipality and the action item you are speaking on. Still muted, the phone number 891. Okay, uh, looks like we'd have to come back to you and hand us down. It looks like there's no other public comment for uh, first public comment, so we will close that and we will go on to our committee of the whole. Uh, and we are um, going to ask uh, Mrs. Winters if you can lead us in the curriculum and instruction portion of this meeting. I am thrilled to. So we have a couple things for CNI tonight. It's all discussion items. Um, and I welcome collaboration from my fellow board members on all this because we've got some really good stuff coming out of CNI that I know we're all excited about. First, I wanna talk about the preschool expansion meeting that was held at Malberg last Thursday. I was really excited because the whole CNI committee came out to participate as well as many members of our administration. Um, Dr. Morton was there. Ms. Linda King was there, uh, the principal of Malberg, Ms. Edwards was there. Dr. Morton, who am I missing? I don't wanna miss anybody. Oh, Ms. Mallory, I'm sorry, Ms. Mallory. <laughs> Ms. Mallory was there to help us with some special education questions. Um, Ms. Wilson was there to help keep us on time, which as you all know, I am challenged with that often as a committee chair, so I appreciated all her effort. And of course, everybody who helped um, make sure that we could be seen live on Zoom as well for people who want to participate, Mr. Plavinsky, um, Mr. Holman. Oh, and uh, Maureen Carozza, who is the head of the, I believe she's the head of the child study team at Malberg. When my daughter was there, she's a social worker, but I don't wanna, I don't want to, uh, okay, she's a social worker. So sorry about that. So I hope I didn't miss anybody. It was a really nice night. We had, I think about 50 people in the room over at Malberg, which was great. We decided to hold it at Malberg because I thought it would be the most comfortable place for our preschool families to come meet us. Since for many of them, this is the first time that they're going to be part of our school district and wanted to have a welcoming and open atmosphere. We also had a lot of participation on Zoom and I know a lot of people have watched the meeting on YouTube. So I hope that everybody's questions were answered. We took, um, we had a presentation and then board members answered some commonly asked questions that have been submitted. And then we took questions both from the audience and online. And I think the overall tone of the meeting was very positive. I think people were happy that they understood the program a little bit better than they did coming in. 
if there are burning questions that people out there have that were not answered yet, I encourage them to continue to communicate with us. We look forward to communicating back for full transparency and discussion as we move forward with preschool expansion. Dr. Morton, is there anything you wanted to add to that? I think uh, you summarized it all. Great job. Thank you. And again, for the content of the meeting, I don't want to go through all of that now, um, but it is available on YouTube if anybody would like to see what we discussed. And like I said, please continue to ask us your questions. We do need to know what you're all thinking, and we enjoy the interaction with the community. Ms. Stern. So, um, Mrs. Wilson, is there anything you have to add that you can share about just questions that might be forthcoming? Yes, Mrs. Stern, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me, tomorrow uh, we will be launching a question portal on the Barclay Preschool, I'm sorry, the Malbird Preschool um, website for parents and interested people to ask their questions about the program and what's happening. Those answers will also go up on the website so people can reference um, other people's questions and get answers. Thank you so much, Ms. Wilson. Um, I really appreciate all the work everybody's doing around communication. I know it's been a concern since we're trying to launch this very quickly. We got notified of our funding opportunity in October and we will be opening classrooms January 2nd. So it's a very tight timeline. We continue to strive for transparency and discussion with the community. The next thing on our agenda is the course of study timeline. Dr. Morton, if you could speak to that. Absolutely, uh, Ms. Winters. Uh, so course of study timeline. So our course of study, uh, high school course of study booklet is currently under revision. Uh, the book booklet will schedule, it's scheduled to be published uh, in early January. We will have a course of study booklet presentation discussion at the next CNI meeting on January 2nd, uh, 7 p.m. Uh, 7 p.m., I believe, uh, January 2nd. Um, course of study information nights. Carusi Middle School will be January 3rd. Rosa Middle School, January 4th. And Beck will be January 8th. Thorough presentation. We encourage all uh, eighth grade families uh, transitioning to the high schools to attend those information nights. They're very informative um, and families will be we provide it with much information about the transition process. Uh, high schools will host their open nights. Uh, high School West will go first on January 24th. And High School East will host their open house on February 1st. Excellent, thank you so much. So just to recap, any of you out there who are really excited about course of study, come to the January CNI meeting. It is open to the public. We always love to have people there with us to get the information. And as a brand new high school parent this year, I did the eighth grade information nights and in both open houses last year. And I will say it was really helpful in understanding the high school schedule, how to select courses and the strengths of both high schools. So I really encourage families to take that opportunity. The next thing on the agenda is the one thing that everybody in Cherry Hill seems to agree on, which is our math pathways. I am excited to say that although a lot of times being on the board is like being, on, being in Yelp where people just tell you what they don't like, the math pathways are something that I have gotten a ton of positive feedback from from all corners of the community. So I think we finally cracked the code. We should just keep talking about math. Um, Dr. Morton, can you give us an update on the math pathways? Absolutely. So I've shared the, uh, the, the pathways framework here uh, on the screen as well just as a reminder for everyone. Um, but so for next year, we're, we're set to introduce uh, two new courses, data science and quantitative reasoning. Uh, so these new courses um, have actually, actually the planning for these new courses have actually began in the previous year with professional development, uh, curriculum, curriculum teams coming together to, uh, to write the new courses and work continues in this year as we seek to identify staff members and provide additional training for our um, fall 2024 school year launch of these two new courses. These are the initial pathway courses that we have, um, that we, we've introduced thus far. 
there is much enthusiasm and excitement about the uh, inclusion and introduction of AP Calculus AB as well. And I put this slide up here um, as a reference for us to, to just speak to the timeline a bit. So AP Calculus AB is scheduled to be introduced in the 25-26 school year. Um, the reason being is that the, the course highlighted here, Calculus A, which currently runs um, in our schedule, is a course that allows students to take uh, a calculus course without having to take an AP course. Um, that course is actually being eliminated and being replaced by Business Calculus, which is scheduled to be introduced in the 25-26 school year as well. If we were to introduce calc uh, AP Calculus AB, it would eliminate an opportunity for students at the A level to take a calculus course. Um, and that's not what the sequencing that we had planned initially, you know, um, uh, held for us. So we'll be looking to do our uh, foundational work as we move forward into the spring of this year. Our staff will take part in curriculum conversations as well as professional development. Uh, the courses that are highlighted in blue will be proposed as new courses in our course of study guide for the next school year. Um, and we look forward to, to being able to implement these courses with full fidelity and with excellence and moving forward. Thank you so much. I appreciate that explanation. Like I said, this is maybe the first time in the year that I've been on the board that everybody seems to agree that this is a really good idea. So I think I'm just going to keep going with it. Um, I do appreciate the enthusiasm from the community. And I also appreciate, Dr. Morton, that you and your team continue to move forward thoughtfully. Um, with a planned out sequence for implementing these courses in a way that makes sense for our students, because it will be a shift in the way that students take these courses. We wanna make sure that we're not eliminating things prematurely so that students lose access to an A-level calculus course. Um, so thank you for that explanation. I really appreciate it. The next thing that we are going to discuss is in October, we were given a text for approval um, for ELA. It's for, an, it's for 11th grade English, which I believe the theme is the American dream and Ms. Stern was our reader. So if she would like to give the report on lessons in chemistry. So everyone knows that I am a slow, slow reader, um, frustratingly so, but this was a very captivating book, which I also listened to partially as an audiobook. So it was a combination of audiobook and reading. Um, it, it, I think I'm just gonna do a high level overview. It addresses themes about um, women's ability to be successful or inability um, in the 50s, it was the 50s, 60s, 50s, 60s, um, I, to be, you know, to struggle to be successful in science um, and have their own careers. Um, there are a lot of, I was talking to Mrs. Winters about the fact that I, forget, I forget how hard it was for women to be successful, have their own independent careers for um, what it was like when in this country, when um, women may have been in relationships and had children without being married. That's a topic that also comes up in the book. Um, um, there's some really tough subjects. This is for older, this is for 11th grade, 11th grade. 11th grade. Um, I have two 11th graders at home and I can assure you that they can handle the subject matter. Um, I think they're topics that come up on a regular basis with our students that age. Um, but it, there was, I don't, I, you used a word to describe the level of it, like the engaging language in the book. So for someone like me who easily gets distracted when I'm reading and goes off track, it was really engaging. Um, and I think that was, it was, it was very refreshing. Um, I don't know what the language that you, you used a word to describe the languaging in the book, which I really, anyway, yeah, I can't remember, but I remember I was like, Oh, I like that term. I reread it um, for this. I had read it when it first came out because I tend to read anything that comes out that's on a bestseller chart. Those on the board know that I just devour books. It's my coping mechanism. So I had read it earlier, but I actually reread it yesterday and today just to prepare for the board meeting through the lens of an 11th grader because that's a very different reading process when you're reading something as adult just for your enjoyment and then looking at it to how would an 11th grader interpret this text yeah and, and as I, Ms. Sturm said there there's a little bit of language 
and there's some mature situations, mature but nothing topics. graphic on the page um, at all. No. And it really, I think, contextualizes for students the challenges the main character has in being successful during this time period and having her career and also her triumph at the end, which I think is important. When I was having conversations around this book, a lot of it was that as we teach the American dream, some of the books that we teach really are, are negative on it. And some of the students may be coming out of the course saying, I don't, maybe the American dream doesn't exist. Maybe the American dream, you know, there are all these challenges. So I actually think this book was a high, was a modern, engaging, very quick read, quirky text that was funny and engaging too. And I think we'll draw students in. Like I said, I just devoured it in two days again, but it also brings out a lot of themes around the American dream and what it means to be successful and the struggles that people have that I think will be instructive for students as they discuss it. Another piece I liked about it was that the characters were quirky. Um, there was a lot of like, you know, you we read something and we have a presumption about like the way that topic is being viewed and they people would, however, the perspective of the, um, the characters might have a completely different view, um, which I really enjoyed because I think, you know, helping not only us as adults, but obviously really our kids in our schools appreciate divergent views, all different taking perspective, taking it's an important skill in life. Um, it's actually part of our, you know, our responsibility is to teach empathy in schools is actually considered one of our responsibilities as board members that we, we don't teach it, but that we oversee that it's being taught. It's an important part of education. So I just like those aspects too. Um, and and uh, bonus point was that um, every single person who saw that that I, we had the book in my house and I was reading was like, oh, that's a great book. Oh, that's oh, have you? I heard great things about that. Like nobody had anything bad to say. As a matter of fact, a lot of people were really very positive about it. So um, I was happy to be reading a, a a a book that was, I guess, on trend. I guess I don't know. So anyway, um, very very pleased about this. And I was thinking about my eleventh grade sons reading this book and them they're just not going to be like they won't believe it they're not going to be like I don't that that wasn't really the way it was yeah it actually really was the way it was so um I think it's and important not long ago. the history yeah, not that long ago the historical context is is important um and it brings it alive so, so the book is yeah, let's say the book is approved for the 11th graders we're excited um I have heard that there are high school teachers both at east and west who are really excited to teach this book it had been previously piloted at east um, so we're really excited and I can't wait to hear the feedback from the students about what they think about this book. So as you all know, this is my favorite part of being on CNI. It's just the reading. So, and the last thing on our CNI agenda is a doctoral dissertation study. Yes, absolutely. So we have a request from a doctoral student at a William Patterson University, uh, individual seeking to survey five middle school teachers uh, for an eight to 10 minute survey. Purpose of the survey is to, is, to, is to determine if there are relationships between teacher cultural competence, um, student engagement, social economic status, and student achievement, and if they are predictors of student engagement and achievement. Uh, the survey will be done anonymously and it's strictly voluntary for staff. Thank you. Do any board members have any questions about things that were on the CNI agenda? Excellent. We must have done a wonderful job this month, CNI committee. Thank you so much, everybody. And thank you, Mrs. Winters. And now we're going to go on to our business and facilities committee. Mr. Greenbaum, if you could lead that, please. Thank you. So I have the honor of deferring to everybody else for this discussion. <laughs> um, so we're going to start with um, Mrs. Sugars. Do you have anything to share on preliminary budget numbers for 2023, 2024? No, 24, 25. What I wanted to share was sort of where we landed in 23, 24, so we know where we are starting in 24, 25. Sorry, I thought I was going after you, so I wasn't prepared. <laughs>
So I just wanted to talk about some numbers here, uh, just as I said, to sort of give us a, a refresher of where we landed in 23, 24. Um, I don't, obviously we don't have any numbers for 24, 25 yet, um, but I just thought it would be important to kind of discuss a few of these topics as we start to prepare to put our budget together. So you can see here that we have traced um, tax levy, um, cap, banked cap, the amount of the budget and state aid since 2017-18. And if we start with what our tax levy was, you can see that um, you can see the history of our tax levy over the past couple of years. An addition in the 23-24 school year was the fact that we had tax levy raised because it was approved through the bond referendum process uh, for debt service. We, uh, the bonds were approved to be sold. We sold some of the bonds. And now um, on a, a yearly basis, we need to pay back those bonds. So that's why we see the addition of debt service fund uh, tax levy. In 23, 24, we had not had that since 2018, 19. So our total tax levy, <clears throat> 23, 24, increased by just over 15 million, but the bulk of that was attributable to the debt service fund. As we are developing our general fund budget, we don't typically, the debt service piece of it, as I said, was already approved the re through the referendum process. So it's not uh, part of the approval process. However, um, we do factor it in when we are looking at tax impact. So in the 23-24 school year, you can see that the tax impact of the general fund on the average assessed home, which is about $225,000, um, in Cherry Hill was $104, and the tax impact of the debt service was $328.68. And you'll notice in the far right column, uh, we talk each year about what our tax levy cap is. Uh, our tax levy cap moving into 24-25 would be 2%, uh, would be 3.7 million. So I'm just throwing that number out there to give you some perspective um, on how much Assuming that all other factors are equal, um, that would be the max that our tax levy could increase um, in the 24-25 budget. Except for the fact, and we'll move on to our next topic, which is banked cap, is that we do have some banked cap. So can anyone tell me what banked cap is? Mrs. Gallagher. <laughs> so three years previously, correct? If we don't raise taxes to 2%, the remainder that's left can be used without a vote to the community. Very good, Mrs. Gallagher. So um, it is, but, but the one thing that I always try to point out, it's not a pot of money, it is taxing authority. So that would allow us to increase our taxes by our banked cap. So we have banked cap that was raised in 21-22 because we did not go to the full 2% in 21-22. We also have some from 22-23. The 21-22 the banked cap will expire in the 24-25 budget if we do not use it. Um, and then we'll have another year with the $1.3 million in banked cap that we could move into the 25-26 year. So that is also another option, should that be something that the board wanted to take a look at. And then we move on to our total budget. Um, so we ended the year, we, the 23-24 budget uh, with a pretty high budget, general fund budget number of 254,422,000. The reason that number was so significant was because we used quite a bit of capital reserve dollars, if you recall, not only did we put in rod grant applications for preschool we also put in some rod grant applications for non-preschool projects and so we had to provide our local share of those projects through our capital reserve account um, and so the, when we use capital reserve that has to be approved through the budget process and so back when we were developing our 23-24 budget we allocated capital, capital reserve dollars to provide our local share of those projects. Now, our regular ROD grant applications were not approved, and so that money will go back into the capital reserve account. However, our preschool projects were approved, and uh, you know we will be using those capital reserve funds to approve those preschool projects. Also, as you can see there, um, our debt service budget 
uh, for 23-24 was just over 22 million. And that was the payment back of our bond and interest on our bond referendum. So when you add those two together, we were $277 million uh, last year in budget. And so our final category, as we uh, take a look at our state aid each year, you can see from 1718 that our state aid has um, increased significantly. Uh, we took over the past couple of years, have had some significant jumps in the amount of state aid. Um, I make no predictions on what our state aid will be for next year. Um, so we'll wait and see what that looks like. And then also, as you can see last year, we also received debt service aid. And again, that was because um, that was because of the bond referendum and that was to help us pay back our, our principal and interest. So I thought it was important just as we gear up for budget and start talking about budget and start talking about priorities, just to have uh, some idea of what the budget looked like last year, what the 2% looks like, what the bank cap is that's available and what our state aid looked like last year. Again, making no predictions about what it will look like next year. Any questions? Okay. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate that. All right, give me just a moment here. All right, now for the other Committee of the Whole agenda item for BNF, we have board budget priorities for the 24-25 budget. Uh, so give me just a moment here, and I'm going to bring that up in my notes. All right, so this is going to be a little bit of around the room going to different stakeholders to talk about uh, what some of the budget priorities are as we move uh, towards budget discussions. Um, first, we'll start in the CNI department with achievement, and I will defer to Mrs. Winters. I believe most of these are recommendations coming out of the NJSLA data and the CNI team, but I will defer to Mrs. Winters. Thank you. And I've been joking around with Mr. Greenbaum when he asked me for this list that this is my holiday wish list. I've been very good this year. So when we were talking about the NJSLA scores, we had a couple of key recommendations come out of those discussions between the CNI committee and the administrative team that works on CNI. And I think the top discussion that we had was about adding basic skills teachers to the elementary schools for next year's budget cycle. This year, it was felt that the high impact tutoring program, which is being paid for with state money, we received a grant from the state, is going to fill in those gaps for students who need help with basic skills who may be still struggling due to the effects of the pandemic and the school closures at that time. But that is just a one-time burst of money as far as we know. We don't know if that program will still continue to exist next year. So as the committee was discussing, it came out that only seven out of our 12 elementary schools currently have access to a basic skills teacher. Now that doesn't mean they each have an individual basic skills teacher. It means that there's a basic skills teacher who can go into that building and work with those students. That means that there's five elementary schools where there is no access to a basic skills teacher. So that is one thing that coming out of CNI, I would ask the board respectfully consider going into budget negotiations for next year. I do not have hard numbers on what the cost would be and even how many additional basic skills teachers would be needed to serve all 12 elementary schools. So those are conversations we would need to have going forward. The second thing that came out of the NJSLA discussions was possibly adding one full-time ELA support teacher at the middle level. Currently, there is one full-time ELA support teacher at Carusi, but Beck and Rosa share the other teacher between the two schools. So the recommendation that came out of CNI was to add another ELA support teacher so that each middle school could have one full-time ELA support teacher. We were actually wondering if that's possible to do in this academic year rather than wait to go through the budget cycle to add for next September because it's a need we identified based on last year's NJSLA scores. I'm not sure how that, I don't have any updates on how that conversation is going, but that is definitely something the committee wanted to look into because we see a need there and we feel like it would be most impactful. 
the third recommendation that came out of those discussions, as you recall, was adding additional professional development time at the high school level. The way that we've worked that out for this year is that it's going to be an early dismissal for students, which means there'll be no additional transportation costs incurred. So there's no budgetary impact of that change at the high school level. However, if we were to switch back to the original recommendation that came to the committee and have the students come to school late rather than leave early, there would be a budgetary cost with transportation impact. So that's something that I'd like to explore more, whether the benefit of having it be a late arrival for students and having that PD time in the morning, balancing that with any possible transportation costs. So that's a conversation going forward. Um, those were the three three main things. There were other things that came out of the NJSLA presentation. If anybody wants to see it, that presentation exists. It's in the board presentations tab on the website, and you can see all the opportunities for assistance that um, the administration put forward. But as the committee discussed, those were the top three that we came up with. There were two other things that we've identified right now as things that we'd like to start thinking about going into the discussions. The first one came out of, if you'll recall, we did a survey of the full day kindergarten program. This was a couple months ago. And the Hanover group that did this work for us, we surveyed kindergarten teachers, kindergarten families, and members of the full day K committee, which I was on. And one thing that came out of that was the idea of exploring whether additional educational assistance are needed in kindergarten classrooms. Now, I my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that there's variety among the elementary schools and how ed assistants are used and how that impacts kindergarten. So definitely more discussion and exploration would need to take place about whether that recommendation is viable, what it would mean, and whether it would have the impacts that we would hope for. So that's something I would like to explore further. And then the last thing that we've been consistently discussing in CNI is rethinking the SAC program before and after school programs at the elementary level and also thinking about it with respect to our preschool now that we're doing preschool expansion. Because with preschool expansion, if you're assigned to a private provider site in the community, parents will be able to access before and after care for their students through that private provider. However, the students at Malberg currently do not have that opportunity. So that's something that we were looking to explore as well. Um, both, like I said, globally, when we look at before and after care programs at the elementary level, because we know there's a need for that, and also especially looking at it as it reflects in our newly expanded preschool program. So those were the main concerns coming out of CNI. Do any other CNI members have anything else they'd like to add or clarify? Ms. Stern. Yeah, I mean, I just think like, you know, we, We've made a lot of progress, I think, on identifying, you know, um, major milestones in our in our district goals. And, you know, we the math pathways, which right, was like, you know, the one thing everyone can agree on seems like, um, you know, that came because we have now a secondary level, you know, math science supervisor, right? I I mean, that's not why it came. That has been able to be carried through. Um, having someone at the helm really leading that and that we really, to me, it really speaks to the value of having, having added those positions. Um, I think there's a lot of um, reasons why we need to keep looking at that. You know, we're in a, you know, we're, we're finally in a place where we have a budget that can support the type of staffing levels that we know we really need. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's, um, you know, we need to provide that. So I'm, I'm in support of doing that. I mean, I think we, you know, we know there's just the conversation again and again and again about achievement. You know, if we want to be successful with that, we need to make sure we have the staffing and the, the curriculum and the supports in place to do that. So I'm a fan. Thank you. All right. Ms. Elmore Shatton, did you have anything? Yeah, I'll just add on to what Mrs. Stern is saying. Of course, in my report, I'll do a lot more, but um, <laughs> I think it is beneficial to note that it, it's all, it all is going to play into one of our major goals for the district, which is the percentage increase in students that are at proficiency, whatever that that looks like, um, and and add on to even our further our goals in terms of staff wellness as well. I think if some of these additions are added and taken into consideration, um, staff wellness and morale is likely to also go up. 
you so much. So I think those are the major recommendations coming out of CNI. But Mr. Greenbaum, if you need further recommendations, you know my wish list is longer and I'm happy to provide you with more ideas. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, another topic that came up was a desire for uh, special education programs at more schools across the district and looking into uh, where it might be feasible to do so. And I believe Mrs. Cern had uh, some thoughts on that. Yeah, so I think the topic uh, from kind of the comprehensive level has been how do we, you know, this is year three of work of having, you know, special education as part of a focus in our goals, right? And in year three, okay, we've, you know, we've done a lot of the groundwork, where do we go from here? Um, and really, we're at a place of um, shifting our focus more in a comprehensive way to being more student-centered and family-centered. And or in Dr. Morton's um, verbiage, it's customer service oriented. So we're really looking at how do we shift that. And part of that um, or, or improve upon that, I should say it's not shift it, but improve upon that. So, and part of that is ensuring that, um, in a comprehensive way, we have the programming that's needed in the places where our students, um, you know, can access it appropriately and access it in a comprehensive manner. Sometimes now it's, it's complex. I think, you know, it, it would be nice if it was a simple, um, well, let's move this around or shift this around, but it doesn't work unfortunately it doesn't work that way because our students with special needs are in, their needs are very individualized at times. And there's a lot that changes. And as you guys have heard me say, as a parent of a child um, with special needs, you know, I saw through that my own child's uh, educational career and the other children I know um, who were in the same cohort, I saw all the shifts that happened. So um, it's not a linear path. And I think that's that's the main thing. So we need to do this in a very thoughtful, well-developed and comprehensive manner. It doesn't make sense to do things as a one-off. You have to look at it as a whole picture. So from a budgetary standpoint, I don't know exactly what that looks like yet. We're having the, um, the um, a population study done. So we'll have a better idea when we have that information, but um, I, you know, it's my understanding that there's been some more preliminary discussions about this and um, I'm, you know, from that will be some recommendations and there may be, there, there very well could be a budgetary impact to that. So we just, I just want to put out there that I think we need to be prepared for that aspect it, as we move in that direction, assuming that, you know, there may be some changes that are recommended. So that's where my thinking is. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mrs. Elmore Stratton. Sure, when I just, I, maybe it goes there, I don't know. But just during all of these discussions, are we having uh, Mr. Mallory be a part of that for specifically looking at what special education needs are budgetarily and making sure that we're in alignment? I mean, as a board member, I can say actually these discussions, the, the, the board has said the how, I'm sorry, the what, the what, the what, and it's actually the administration. I mean, they're doing all the how work. So, hey, Mrs. Mallory. Yeah, so I was just gonna kind of answer that question. So this is something we do annually as part of our budget process anyway. We're constantly looking at compliance, number of students in the program, how many students it's at each grade level. Um, that's our primary focus. And then we look at um, our budget and the impact it would have, um, you know, making sure that the resources are available. So this is something that we do every year anyway. So that is definitely information that we, we will share with the board moving forward and having those discussions. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments on this item? Okay. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we'll move on to HR priorities and I will defer to Ms. Elmore Stratton again for that. Thank you. Sure. So I, I don't want to get too deep into my priorities <laughs> for our committee um, because then I'll have nothing to report in my section. So, uh, <laughs> however, I do want to put it out there, especially since Ms. Sugar spoke about the cap and, and the possibility of that being used or utilized. Um, we really have to look at what we're doing in terms of making ourselves competitive with surrounding districts in terms of our starting salaries. 
right now that is a a huge uh, issue and it is affecting not only the recruitment but also retention and turnover as well. Um, so we we as a committee we've talked about this over and over we've and you know and spoken with all the stakeholders involved. It we really need to look at the numbers and get us up to where we're competitive, almost similar to like with SAC, right? We we know we needed to be competitive with other areas in terms of those salaries. And so we made some adjustments. So um, I have specific numbers, but I can't share those here, but you know, obviously the committee will get that. Um, one other thing to share, sorry, my notes are in four different places right now. Um, some of the other things we were kind of thinking about um, is the need to add on additional positions in order for us to meet those uh, achievement gap closing goals. Uh, and I, I believe, I'm not going to speak on the, the committee, but it's my belief that our biggest investment right now needs to be in our people. Our staffing. They are our greatest assets in the district and nothing can get done without them. And so uh, right now we need to look at what's needed in terms of that. And I think you spoke to it a little bit, uh, Ms. Winters, in terms of us needing basic skills teacher, uh, a be basic skills teachers added on. Um, also looking at, hold on, Also taking a look at, uh, hold on, da, 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 da. sorry, my notes are everywhere. If we, are, if we are looking at in terms of just the retention piece of things, I would tell you that the consensus of, you know, from the committee and things that we've talked about, um, or at least uh, Ms. Ms. Libra has brought to our attention and others, um, we have a couple districts around us specifically that are already going, their, their contracts are ending. And so they're in those contracts, they're, the starting salaries are going to be bumped up. So that's going to make it harder for us when right now we're at the lower end of where our starting teacher salary, salaries are. Um, I would say that additionally, uh, hold on, go down. I'd also add to that, that if we would go to the 2%, um, couple that with hopefully increased state, state funding, hopefully, um, we'd be able to add on some of the things that um, the educators have really asked for. So basic skills, teachers for math and ELA, behavioral behaviorists, I totally said that wrong, additional counselors and additional ed assistants as well for general education and inclusion. So exactly what you spoke to in terms of kindergarten, uh, and, and those other uh, needs where we have to have some other eyes in the room in order for them to do their jobs to the best of their ability. Um, and then we'll talk about it more when I, it's my turn, but this doesn't mean that we um, stop at just the entry level. We're gonna have to look at the top of the guide uh, because that's gonna be the key to the retention piece and making sure that not only are we attracting new teachers, but we're keeping them here. Uh, and that's something that's happening around the world in terms of teacher turnover. Um, but I don't want to be a spoiler for my committee okay. section. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any any other additions or questions about the HR items? That looks like no. And I believe Ms. Gallagher uh, wanted to add something on about food service. Yeah. <clears throat> so. Um, Food service, I know, isn't necessarily part of the budget, but since I know SAC was discussed, they're kind of separate business units within. So um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we kind of all had this, I mean, we all kind of feel the same way, but um, a bunch of us kind of came together and we're really passionate about um, putting out a new RFP for food service. Um, and so that is something that will start in the beginning of next year. Is that correct, Mrs. Sugars? So. Um, a new RFP will be put out in, I think, January's time, and um, we will look to, in my opinion, I would love to bring in some more like healthier local options uh, for our students to consume at breakfast and lunch. So. Okay, thank you very much. 
And I think with that, I think that wraps up BNF Committee of the Whole. Thank you. Okay, well, this is Str Elmer Stratton. You referred to this several times. So I'm going to ask you to lead us in a human resources discussion or I don't know how much can really be discussed. But. Um, we have we have a, a few things, uh, especially it's my last two meetings. So I'm going out hard, right, Ms. Lieber? We got it. So uh, for our HR committee, the the consistent. She says no. She definitely wrote none, and I'm definitely adding like five things. Um, so for the HR committee, our recurring theme for this year has just been getting some more folks in the door. Uh, and then we've had extensive conversations, uh, again, with a variety of stakeholders around the district about what is going to make us attractive, who should be uh, we be looking at in terms of competition, and what we need to do. So just to give you a little bit of facts on where we are, um, there is the following districts right now that have an entry-level salary above us is about six or seven or actually more than that. Um, so, and some of those include Pensalkin, Morristown, Haddonfield, Haddon Heights, Lindwall, Voorhees, Mount Laurel, Evesham, like Lenape. And those are all the things that are surrounding us. And so we're in the center of the pocket and we're paying the, our teachers starting less, okay? Um, I, I can't say those um, expense, the specifics to that please, but the salary guide is on the website though, right? There we go. Um, so, and then another fun fact, Morristown is going to surpass Cherry Hill in 24, 25 with a higher starting salary. And I know how there's some in our community that love to compare us to Morristown. So if we're going to compare, let's compare the dollars also. Um, and, and I'm saying all this as uh, our committee really strongly suggests to the board to go to the 2%. Uh, so that we can make sure that we get some new things in, in place. Um, and I don't want to be too stressful on just the recruitment aspect of it, because we did start this year with actually a lower number of uh, open positions than we did the year prior. However, there's, you guys have seen my reporting, there's lots of retirements happening, there's random leaves, there's random changeovers, so we have to make some adjustments. Um, so there is some more things in terms, specific details in terms of the salary guide that we need to look at, I'm saying we, that should be looked at before you all vote on the budget. My biggest suggestion here, uh, not mine, our committee's biggest suggestion here is that prior to anything being added, made or chopped or whatever, that you all have a conversation with Kwame uh, you know, someone represented from the board, someone representative of uh, the, the unions in terms of where we need to go with those salary guides. I think that lends itself to the work that we're doing in terms of collaboration uh, and how that is crucial and critical to us making the right changes and utilizing our dollars the correct way. So, and to add to that, I'm just going to ask Mrs. Fleischer to share a little bit about how the LMC plays all into this as well. Great, thank you so much, um, Ms. Selmer Stratton. So the LMC is, as we've spoken about before, um, over the last year especially, is the Labor Management Collaborative, which um, is fully supported by the administration, Dr. Morton and um, Mr. Steve Redburn, who's the head of the CHEA. Um, both are um, leaders in uh, that, and Mrs. Elmer Stratton and myself sit on the uh, LMC. And it also has representatives from each of the schools, um, uh, from principals, administration, uh, all the way from custodians to uh, educational assistants. It really runs the gamut of across the board of our district. And it's become extremely important and a great way for us to be able to um, communicate uh, across the board. And the fact that uh, the board the, of education actually is able to sit on it is something that was always um, encouraged and we appreciated the invitation um, from Dr. Morton and Mr. Redfern. Um, and uh, what we've really come to learn is that we're able to all talk about basic things that normally were in separate sections. 
and we're not able to have conversations. Um, and now we're able to be in the midst of discussions that normally wouldn't occur. And one thing I'll just throw out besides us talking about this, just going back to it is we had a calendar discussion and different ways that the, the teachers wanted to see the calendars before the, before we even got to the PL committees. And it's, we're going about things a little differently now to try to make us a more holistic and open um, district. And it's, you know, step-by-step step, and it's going to take a long time for us to get to the, the actual point that we want to be at, but I think it's really helpful. And we actually this year put it into our board um, goals and we really want to do that in order to codify like LMC to be something that is going to always stay in our district and will always be used as a great communication source. Um, so at what Mrs. Elmer Stratton is talking about, I think it is a prime example of where this is gonna show the importance. Um, we can talk about what they need, what they want as, as we go into um, you know, negotiations um, so that we're all sort of hopefully on the same page or close to being on the same page. Thank you, Mrs. Fleischer. And just some other uh, thoughts about the LMC in terms of how it will affect, how it should affect our work as a board team. Uh, so as in the, the past few meetings that myself and Ms. Fleischer have been involved in, we're starting to see some themes that are coming through of concerns around the buildings. And it's good that we're seeing them because without the LMC, we wouldn't have an opportunity to have everyone in the room at the same time um, and just agreeing on what the priorities are, but also doing a lot of uh, team sharing in terms of um, what's happening in the buildings, what's the major issues, what do they, what are their needs? And so I don't want to get too much into the details, but because I know that uh, Dr. Morton and Mr. Redfern has some fun things planned in the next couple of weeks good for them. <laughs> um, but we do have, uh, we, the, one of the best things that we have done, or I'll say, you know, Dr. Morton has hooked us all up with is being on the New Jersey school climate improvement platform. Uh, one of the, the major themes has been the climate and the culture in some of our buildings. And that's from yeah, top down staff on. So we have to get to a space where we're looking at it. And I love that the LMC is tackling that as one of their priorities right from the beginning. Um, and with that, there's going, there will be, or there's some that has happened, there will be more, but those conversations are not having happening in a silo in terms of hearing what the needs are from the building either. It involves surveying teachers, uh, educators, staff, uh, parents, students, all of those in order to come up with the, what is the major themes happening in each building that needs to change. Uh, and so I know when I first came on, we were talking a lot about what we're here about in the next committee uh, in terms of code of conduct. And just, that was just one of the things that came from them having these conversations. Some things that will go towards your budget that you should think about in terms of this LMC work, which I also will add, if you're not familiar with it, it is something that New Jersey has taken on as a whole. There's several districts participating. Uh, we have teachers, teachers, and there's a nurse right on our, there's a nurse, teachers, and then principals. I'm looking at Mr. Redfern because he makes me, he reminds me. Um, but there's some, some there's a, a gamut of people that are in that room that have gone to some extensive training on how to make this successful in our buildings and how we can take, and they can become the trainers to a building. So a lot of their talks have been train the trainer so we can pass it on. Um, or also finding common threads where we're all doing sort of the same thing, or at least have a foundational same thing, uh, and then going from there. So it, it's really interesting to, uh, conversations, but with the school climate improvement, there's gonna be some conversations where we're, we're specifically will be looking at uh, what, what people think in their buildings, what are their expectations in the buildings, and they, they're coming up in a variety of areas. And I will tell you that one of the top three things that comes out is more hands. More hands make light work. So right now, again, our basic skills, if you if we could get a ballpark range of what that looks like, is that, is it five additional? Is it 12 additional? Is it, what, what's our actual goal? 
I don't know what we, we need to decide this. And that's another reason why I think, not I think, our committee, I know Ms. Fleischer agrees, our, com <laughs> <laughs> our committee strongly suggests that you bring those folks to the table or you have someone assigned uh, to replace myself for one, so that you can hear what is the thread of what's needed. Um, the, the other things in terms of behavior, as I said, climate and culture is a big thing. So now I'm gonna say what I have been pushing for is that they need assistance in terms of doing this work. The LMC takes lots of time. It takes a lot of dedication from administrators in the building individually, there's localized individual, individualized teams um, and culture and climate is the main concern in terms of getting the educators able to actually do what you want them to do. So we can't sit here and have, you know, we bought this curriculum, we're doing this, we're doing that. And then we put this stuff out there with an educator that has a classroom that they don't have any uh, educational assistance. They don't have any time to plan. They don't have this, they don't have that. We can't do it. So I don't need to pull up my, I did have some more fun facts on why it's important, but uh, you know, we need to have them at the table to decide how many basic skills teachers are going to be needed to actually be effective. Our other suggestion is really before you budget out, looking at what uh, the additional positions were that were added. Have they? How have they been effective? Because is that something that needs to be duplicated, or is it something that needs to be uh, put and course corrected to something different? Um, the other thing is again, for your budget, if you don't go to 2%, you will not be able to do any of this, not even on a small scale. So uh, educational assistance, you're not gonna get what you need if you don't go to the two. Uh, it just has to happen. Um, another thing uh, in terms of just the climate and culture, as I said, this is something that I really suggest is that we look in investing in a position that can assist with that LMC work, uh, or at least putting some additional dollars to help them to get that work done. Because again, it's a lot of meeting time, a lot of outside time. And besides that, one of the running themes since post COVID has been kids are different than they were before the pandemic. Well, what have we done to help the educators to get past that? So we we're pushing the, you know, our goals. We want them to close the gap. We want them to engage the community. We want them to be present in the classroom and teach empathy and, and social emotion learning. And then we're paying them nowhere near what they're worth. So I have some specific dollars and cents that I can give to you, but I'm sure Ms. Sugars can present them to uh, the BNF committee. <laughs> a whole lot better, but um, I will be requesting a meeting before I am done between uh, our Mr. Redfern, our our educational assistant union leader, uh, Dr. Morton, Ms. Stern, and Mr. Mayor, so that we can discuss uh, just how we keep this on track and especially on track post a new superintendent. Um, any questions on that or additions? Okay, so go ahead, Mr. Mayor. Just um, initially, you know, nothing that you've said is a surprise. Um, with respect to climate and culture in particular, these are conversations which are tremendously important. Um, and we have to do more than identify them and talk about them, which I'm, I'm sure you and everyone else um, acknowledges, understands. I, I, and and I've, I've always supported those efforts. Um, we look forward to finding ways to make that happen. Um, budgetarily, um, you touched a little bit of, um, on course correcting. So I, you know, the way I look at that is, is, is efficiency. You know, are there efficiencies that we can gain um, in, in uh, identifying opportunities to supplement the staffing needs at, a, at every level, um, but do so in a way that, that is um, thoughtful um, because simply adding, 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 adding at some point, um, the money won't be there, regardless of whether we go to 2%. And there may be very little pushback there. Um, with regards to, when you did, I had one, one question that I 
I jotted down before you mentioned it, so this may be moot now, but um, whether or not there might be an opportunity in professional development to, um, uh, with regards to climate and culture, to ensure improvement in that regard. Um, and train their trainer is something that I'm familiar with in, in other areas. Whether or not that's something that you or the LMC had, had considered as an option, it sounds like you have. Absolutely. Uh, PD is another huge area where we suggest uh, a deep investment in terms, uh, but an investment in the right direction, uh, perhaps looking at doing some of the things like what we've done in the last two PDs where we've had speakers come in and speak to those specific topics. Uh, so, and then there are a few schools that uh, I know Carusi for one have reached out to some outside sources to come in and, and just do some workshops with staff on uh, restorative justice and what that looks like, uh, but how to talk about the culture and climate in terms of just the staff is also another conversation. So perhaps a PD for that is recommended as well. Um, and it could all be led by the new person that you all put in place to handle climate and culture. So just putting that out there, they could also handle engagement and relationships, which he can't do it all. Uh, and also they may even be able to look at what we're, what our relationships are in terms of with our parents and students and engagement. Uh, I hope that in our next meeting, we'll have our presentation. Maybe, no, January. Okay, January, give them some time. So we'll wait, but you'll be able to see where we are in terms of, in time, in terms of HR. Uh, it's our annual report uh, that usually is just closed to uh, our committee, but uh, the HR team, I, I've asked them to prepare something to share with the community, specifically you all, while you're making these budget decisions so that you can see where they really need the dollars and the directed, um, as we love to say, directed interventions in order for them to do the work. Um, and, and again, people is the biggest, uh, the biggest resource we have and we have to find a way to get them here and then keep them here. So Mrs. Stern. So, I mean, I, I think, um... I had a strong facial reaction to, which I guess you're not surprised um, because, you know, I, I aspirationally, you know, I, I, I think there's a lot of alignment in what you're talking about. And I think we have to also be um, practical. Um, and as, you know, Mr. Mayor, you know, talked, referred to budgetarily and, and with efficiencies, but, you know, we have a 2% cap. We have, potentially banked cap we could go into, but what we're talking about budgetarily, the things that you're talking about are significant. So I just want to be very realistic about as you, as you exit with, with dropping all those ideas and there are many of them are fantastic and they align with what we talked about earlier. I also want to manage a little bit kind of the aspirations and, and say that I think um, we have to be really thoughtful about how we, where we go with all this. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm going to say, I see things a little bit differently from what you're saying. I mean, I, I think ideal, the ideas I align with, um, I think some of the, the number of positions you're talking about, um, you know, I think we, we really need to understand the numbers before we, we go there. So absolutely, you know, absolutely. that's where I'm coming from. And I know that this was our time to dream and dream big committee of the whole, right? Um, Mrs. Elmore Stratton, <laughs> especially you, you're dreaming the biggest. And I think we're all, we got to wake up from the dream and we, we got to also live the life with, with I after the dream. So no, we, we definitely need to manage, manage expectations for the staff in the district, but we also need to recognize that we set a goal for staff wellness and part of that wellness is ensuring that they are able to live with the inflation costs in terms of child care, living, uh, all the things that we're asking them to do. Um, and a lot of it is time intensive and a lot of our, our, our educators are very stressed. Our educational assistants are extremely stretched. So yes, I'm being very aspirational here. Uh, 
in this space, and I know you guys will drill down the numbers. I also just, I can't say enough how we need to make sure that more ears are at the, the table, or at least you're able to see uh, a little bit clearer what the buildings actually need, not just from uh, the top down, but what's happening down below in term, not below, because they're definitely not below, um, but what's happening in, in, a, in each space. Because sometimes we, we're sitting here talking about what their needs are, and we're totally off the mark. And we and, and it's just things that we're because we're only getting pieces of information. So you have to get to them to have to be at the table, Ms. Stern. And I, I think that's very critical, critically important. And and you, you know, speaking up for that is important. I I also want to raise um just a piece about HR, since we don't normally have this in the whole, but we do tonight. You know, there's another aspect to um which we've been working a lot on this year, which is, you know more of a team approach, more of an aligned approach, which the LMC is a huge part of, but there's a community alignment too. You know, when we have our teachers and our schools being constantly maligned, that impacts our staff and our teachers. Their morale to go to a workplace where they're being maligned on a regular basis. I don't know that, that there is a real that a lot of people are really thinking about that from the staff perspective. And, you know, I think that's part of why we as a board work so hard to, you know, to support LMC, to support those efforts, to really come together, to go to school events, to really show the community, the staff who are working in our buildings, that we appreciate them, that we're not blasting them and, and accusing them of things. We're not maligning them, you know, we are supporting them. And that, you know, if we want to attract and retain excellent staff for an excellent education, then we need to make this district feel like a welcoming district, not one that attacks the staff, not one that attacks the schools, but feels welcoming. And that is another part of HR that we never talk about in public, but is really important to talk about. So I just wanted to add that piece. No, I love that you added, because I, I will say that the, the modeling for what that looks like starts at this table. It starts in these public meetings. Uh, we cannot expect people to feel valued, which is one of the top reasons that people leave is not the money, it's actually they don't feel valued in their space or feel like they are treated as the experts that they are in their space. Um, and that's some of the, again, when, when they're able to share out some of these survey results, you'll be surprised. It's a lot about the value. Uh, but we need to model that here at this table because there have been several meetings where we've come off as if we're on attack in terms of our educators. So we have to be cautious too, because at, you know I think I stress all the time of, we can't ask them to do 10 million things and then turn around and say, how come you didn't get done 10 million in one? And then we give them $2 to do it. So we have to, you know, we gotta make it make sense. Um, so I appreciate you saying that as well. And I, I would also, just to throw this out there again, you're also going to be making, well, hopefully, you'll be looking at SAC positions in addition to this, um, which will affect a lot of your educational assistance, uh, because, you know, a, there's a, there is a nice percentage of them that work that program as well, uh, and doing that and not being competitive with other places where they can go make more at kinder care, JCC, or whatever, that is an issue, um, and as you are I'll say discussing how you can get students off the wait list for those programs, it is also going to require an HR investment, not just with the current staff, but for getting others through the door. Now, later today, you all will be voting and you'll see we have quite a number of SEC uh, appointments today, which is amazing. So uh, I just want to throw that out there to keep that um, in this space. And then the last point that I have... Hold on. Is by January 1st, there will be, hold on, make sure I say it the right way. 
you have at least two, four, six, seven school districts that are negotiating a new collective bargaining agreement for July 1st. And so that's going to mean that the disparity between us and some of those towns that I mentioned is going to grow starting July 1. So we don't have time to wait on it. Uh, we've we've got to make sure that we play it the right way and do it and do it fast. Uh, I will say that it was significant what we did last year in terms of the insurance. That was amazing. Uh, and that has been a help. Now we have to go the extra mile. And just to tie it to, because uh, I'm going to definitely go out saying this, <laughs> to tie it to DEIB, which means diversity, equity, not equality, inclusion, and belonging, this hits to both of them. So I know that we've had things where we've said diversity job fair. Perhaps that's not the right wording, but it's us taking a shot at it. We need to ensure that that equity audit is performed immediately because even that will be some guiding decisions for your budget. You're not gonna be able to do it this year because it's way too soon, but I don't know whose table that needs to go on, but it needs to happen. Um, because in terms of the staffing and, and not just the educators, all of the pieces of our puzzle that make up our school district, unless we are uh, consciously looking at what we're doing uh, and consciously including people, we are almost certainly unconsciously excluding people. So I'll just put that out there. If we're gonna stand on that stance, no matter how much we're challenged by the community in terms of what we're doing, these are the investments that you have to make beyond the bricks and mortar. So anything else, Ms. Fleischer? I think, you I think you covered everything very well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you so much, Ms. Stern. Thank you. Very robust HR discussion, right? Right, <laughs> for once. <laughs> All right, Mrs. Fleischer, uh, if you could please lead us in our policy and legislation committee discussion. Sure, thank you, Mrs. Stern. So tonight for policy and legislation, we only have a few things. Um, the first thing that we wanted to discuss is a code of conduct uh, update. So I'm going to pass it over to Mrs. Wethington for that. Thank you, Mrs. Fleischer. So I just wanna take the board back because we've been talking about this for a while. So we updated the actual code of conduct document a few years ago. If you recall, we updated all the regulations and the statutes because they were outdated in the existing code of conduct document. Then we went on to create three committees, an elementary committee, a middle school committee, and a high school committee. And those committees worked with um, myself and Mrs. Wilson to conduct a thought exchange. We looked at the code of co conduct documents. If you recall, the principals conducted focus groups. What came out of that was that people were not using the code of conduct, parents were not using it, teachers were not using it. Um, st staff and parents had struggled accessing it, didn't know how to read it, and struggled with the purpose. So the committees decided to create documents that were more easily um, viewable and accessible for parents and for staff. Um, we created some infographics, an infographic for parents at each level, an infographic for staff at each level. Uh, we also decided to pr provide restorative training for all teachers in the district that'll be completed by the end of the academic year. And then at that point, we can work on launching the graphics to um, staff in the buildings, and then to parents. Mrs. Wellington. Um, so I think that we're at the point, if I'm correct, and when you and I were speaking, um, that we're going back, rechecking about making sure that the infographics are at a place where the teachers and the staff feel that um, we're all going to be on the same page. And at that point, we're ready to move on. Is that correct? So um, I received feedback from administrators and from teachers when we first discussed the infographics. I've incorporated their comments. We're gonna discuss it at the Labor Management Collaborative with that group, um, I think that's next week. And uh, at that point, we will finalize the documents, but we will not um, launch them, quote unquote, until we've completed all the restorative training for staff. 
Great. Thank you for that update. And I know everyone is very excited to um, finally be able to hopefully move on to this after the new year. Um, the other thing that I know that is going to be, I think Mrs. Elmer Stratton had mentioned it. I don't know exactly how soon, whether it's next month or at the beginning of the year that we'll um, be uh, having a presentation on restorative practices or um, restorative mm -hmm. Um, Justice, I think what is great because it will actually explain what all of our teachers are going to be trained in. Am I right, Dr. Morton? Yes, absolutely. There, there will be a presentation at the uh, December 19th board meeting on restorative practices. Absolutely. Perfect. Thank you so much. Because I think that, first of all, is a great step going into um, rolling everything out for code of conduct, um, the new newer um, infographics and everything for next year. It sort of sets the stage for us to do that. So I appreciate that. Um, so then the next thing, um, does anyone have any questions about any of the updates of the code of conduct? Okay, thank you. The next thing that we're going to talk about is the CUSAC policy updates. So we actually have no first reading policies um, this month, which is actually very rare for us. Um, I don't know if I've ever had that happen when I was actually the uh, chair. Um, and the one thing that I do want to say is it is because we had um, we have a CUSAC review that is either coming up. I'm not sure, Mrs. Webbington, has it happened yet or is it in the process? January. Okay. And um, the one thing I want to give kudos to our administration. So the CUSAC um, is the New Jersey Quality Single Accountability Continuum. It's um, the New Jersey Department of Education's way um, to have self-monitoring and um, making sure that uh, everything is up to, up to snuff for the New Jersey Department of Education. And this is happening in January. And because we needed to get all of our policies to make sure that everything is passed and up to date, the um, Mrs. Wethington, her team um, really worked very hard and um, got everything in early. That's why we had a lot of um, policies that were uh, passed over the last month. We had, you know, as you all knew, it came into all the different committees. The one thing I do want to um, sh make a shout out to is um, Mrs. Cohen, who we talked about is she's actually retiring. We said it was 19.2, but she is actually one of the unsung heroes of the policy and legislation committee. And I think she's listening tonight because I just went on to Zoom and just checked. I think she is. So um, I want to tell her how much we're going to miss her, how much work she's done, because she is the person behind the scenes that gets all the stress as may information, coordinates it, translates it into everything that we need to have whenever it goes to the PL committee. And you know, at any time when anything has to be changed, um, she is the one that does that. It will be a great, well, great loss. Um, and I know Mrs. Wethington is <laughs> very sad about this. And I know all of us should be um, for many different reasons. Besides the policy and legislation, she has affected um, our, everybody in the district in such a wonderful way for many, many years. So um, I just wanted to give her a huge shout out and a thank you from the PNL committee officially. Um, but that is why we don't have any first readings. However, we do have second readings tonight that are going to be that are on the agenda. And um, the the way the policy committee, um, the PNL committee works is you bring up a policy that needs to be updated. Um, and a lot of times it is mandated to be updated uh, and it is brought to us. We have discussion about it, then it goes through the first reading and then the second reading, then it's passed. Um, we have a few tonight and one of them um, has been um, some misinformation has happened over the last you know, week or so. And I wanted to bring that to everybody's attention. The one um, that I'm speaking about is P2270, Religion in Schools. Um, this is actually a district policy that has been in place for a long time, and I'm gonna pass it over to Mr. Green and um, Dr. Morton too, but it's been a policy that we've had um, for a long time, but it's not just a district policy, it's a federal policy that is mandated for us to have. Mm -hmm. um, and we have really no choice, of, and it actually is protective of the students' rights to pray during school day. It's a protected constitutional right that every school Every school in New Jersey, every school in the nation has to have this policy. Um, it's nothing new. Um, it happened to be um, one thing that New Jersey changed. And um, Mrs. Wellington, if I'm saying this wrong, you can let me know. But the main change of this is that on October, by October 1st of every year, um, the district has to sign a waiver that says that we are not impeding on the rights of the students to have prayer in school if they want it. Um, it's just us testifying to the fact 
that we're allowing that. Mrs. Webbington? That's correct. I would just like to say, Mrs. Uh, Fleischer, it's not a waiver. We just have to okay. certify to the Department of Ed that we're following the policy and not impeding students' rights. Perfect. Thank you for that clarification. I appreciate it. Um, and so if you don't mind, Mr. Green and Dr. Morton, if I could sort of pass it over to you to do some more explaining about the policy, the history maybe of it, how it's translated in the schools, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fleischer. So the, as you mentioned, this policy has existed for many years. Um, the board uh, utilizes um, a policy consultant, Strauss Esme, uh, as do almost uh, every single other board of education in the state. Uh, and they routinely uh, issue recommended updates to policies uh, for us and for all other school districts. This policy exists in pretty much every school district in the state. Um, and they have recommended to all the districts. This is not something that, that we have come up with on our own. Um, this is their recommendation uh, to modify the policy. Um, they are not, from a legal standpoint, significant changes. Um, the policy itself has always basically provided um, for the required constitutional protection of our students. There are two components to the First Amendment, freedom of religion and uh, establishment of religion prongs. Uh, under the First Amendment, we as a government entity cannot establish religion in the state, so we cannot force religious instruction we do not bring prayer into the schools, except as the other prong, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, we are obligated to accommodate the religious needs of pupils. Um, and that's what this policy has always provided for. And that's really all it still provides for. The major change, as was just mentioned, um, is the uh, inclusion of the language about the uh, Elementary and Secondary Education Act and the assurances that we have to give to the New Jersey Department of Education um, that we are not impeding pupils' constitutional rights. Um, so there is no significant change in terms of this is not changing the way the district approaches either the education with respect to uh, instruction on religion, which can certainly be done in a curriculum context. Um, we are not bringing uh, you know, people into the district um, to conduct religious exercises, but we do have to accommodate pupils' religious uh, requirements, and that may, on rare occasions, include excusing a pupil from instructional time, although we prefer not to do that unless absolutely necessary, um, in order to pray at specific times of day where it's required. Typically, we're able to accommodate those kinds of requests outside of the instructional time uh, and provide space for pupils to pray apart from um, the rest of the pupil community. So there's no there's no real impact on this in terms of nothing is changing in the district. Nothing is being altered in the, the uh, way we accommodate people's needs. Nothing is being changed in terms of how we approach our obligation not to establish uh, religion in the schools. Um, this is really, from my perspective, a very technical modification um, that's really uh, in reaction to, to two things. One is the requirement that, that we do have to provide these assurances and the other is the United States Department of Education in May of this year revised their guidelines um, with respect to, and they're constantly updating those every about three to five years based on court cases as they come down um, with respect to a guidance to school districts um, in terms of their obligations uh, with respect to religion in the schools. Um, but again, the, the modifications really just relate to the description of that guidance uh, and refer back to it. So really what the, the modification says is we will implement our obligations and carry them out in accordance with that federal guidance, which is based on the United States Constitution and court decisions interpreting it. Um, so I can't stress enough that there's no, there's no essential impact of this policy uh, in terms of the way we have always approached our obligation to protect students' rights um, to religious expression, as well as to protect students and staff from any imposition uh, or establishment of religion in the schools. Thank you so much, Mr. Green, for giving us some of the legal leads for this and the history of everything. And Dr. Morton, I was wondering if you could sort of, um, you know, add your the way that this has translated in our schools and how it is handled. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think Mr. Green provided an, an excellent um, description and overview, you know, from the, the policy standpoint, the legal standpoint. Uh, but the way it's operationalized in schools, uh, it is it is a a uh, I would 
suggest a very uh, confidential process, very uh, well organized. Uh, typically students will make the request to pray of a school administrator, principal, or it could be an assistant principal. School administrator will um, identify a discrete location for that child to engage in their prayer during the time that's requested. Um, it's an extremely respectful process. Uh, the reason why I, I think people have not really un realized that this has been in effect for so long is because of the way that it's handled in schools, one would never know. Um, how it's executed now at High School West, there is an a, there is a administrative conference room adjacent to the principal's office. Uh, the children utilize that room and have used that room in the past to pray. Um, at High School East, there is a room adjacent to the principal's office as well. Um, and children use that room to pray also. Uh, I believe at High School East, uh, the children use that room around lunchtime. Um, Typically, it's during non-instructional time, but but at, there have been other times where I've served as principal in the past where it has been a short time during instruction where, where students have um, had the need to pray. They go in, pray, back to class, no disruptions at all. Um, everything has been uh, everything has been great and, and uneventful, truly. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Morton. I appreciate you know the clarification and letting us understand exactly how this translates into you know the day-to-day -day life of our students. And um, I think it's very it's wonderful that both you and Mr. Green have been able to explain this a little bit more because I just want to make sure everyone understands where you know where this is coming from and what we're doing about it. Um, that is the end of actually what we were talking about tonight, but I wanted to see if anyone from, you know, our committee or from the board have any additional questions about that or any of the other things that we spoke about tonight. Yes, Mrs. Elmer Stratton. Sure. Um, thank you first for bringing up Mrs. Cohen. I was going to speak to that as well. Uh, that's, that's a big loss for our district. Sad to see her have to go, but excited to see what she could do at her retirement. Um, the other thing with that, though, is something that we probably should be in po policies or maybe it should even be in strategic planning is Mrs. Cohen is another great, uh, great case of that's the last person that has a lot of the historical knowledge and data on certain things. You know, before years prior, we had Dr. Malosh, we had some other folks. Right now, Mrs. Cohen, she's a huge source for all of our committees. And so we also... And again, I'm just going to nod to the LMC in terms of practices and how we're going to make decisions moving forward. It's going to result in us not having to always rely on, oh, that person that was here that that knew whatever. We need to get some things in place, and the LMC is a great place for those tools to be developed, uh, and and come out and possibly even work to towards some of these policy suggestions or uh, additions or even questions might come from it. Um, but just want to point that out again that we the relying on historical people that have been here for a bajillion years is not going to be the case moving forward, even in building to building much longer. And so we've got to do something now to attack what's going to happen in five four to five years. Um, in terms of if we do make a strategic plan with our next superintendent. So, and then I did have a question too. For that religion policy, uh, does that also get extended to uh, staff that are in the building? Mrs. Wellington, do you have any um, thought or Dr. Morton? Um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I defer who's going to catch that one? <laughs> it, it does cover staff as well. Okay, it's, thank it's, you, Mr. It's, Green. <laughs> it's a, it's a really, it's a general um, topic of religion in the schools. Great. So it, it, it does apply. It, it's really student oriented and focused, but it, it, co it covers our obligations as to our employees as well. Great and great question, Mrs. Elmer Stratton. Thank you, Mr. Green. I'm sorry, Mrs. Webbington. <laughs> And talk about it, um, but I, you know, I think that we have a, be a better handle on how that is actually um, portrayed in the school, and that was a great question. And um, when you're talking about Mrs. Cohen and her history in the school, you had always brought up Mrs. Elmer Stratton about needing to have that history, and um, I think actually it's like a perfect timing because our next committee is strategic planning, so I might just have to just hand it right over to strategic planning. But I think this is something that 
we have spoken about before, and I think it's something we have to take seriously now, especially because she's leaving. It's <laughs> something that's sort of brought right up to us, but mm -hmm. thank you. All right, thank you, Mrs. Fleischer. And uh, perfect segue because uh, one of the items we'll discuss in strategic planning committee the whole tonight um, touches upon um, a, a great example of it is uh, the religion and or prayer prayer in school policy. Um, three three items to discuss. None of these are new. We've we've talked about them um, in in previous committee meetings, and there's been some reports on it, but. Put a little, you know, we may have a little more um, detail this evening and certainly welcome um, board discussion. Um, the demographic study um, that is going forward with Dr. Grip, sort of, I've been calling it the Grip 2 study, um, is still expected to, he is expected to begin his work in January, so roughly a month or so. Um, and um, it is also my understanding, and, and Mrs. Sugar, certainly if, if I get any of this wrong, which I'm likely to do, feel free to either smack me or just turn your mic on. Um, he has already been provided with all the information that he needs. So he has what he needs to do his work. He's not in a position of having to come back to us uh, and wait um, for, for anything from the board or from the district or administration um, to get his work done. Now there may be, um, some opportunities while he's doing the work as he's engaged that uh, he'll have some questions or he may need to reach out to the district for some things. And um, he's been assured that that cooperation will be, uh, will be swift. And um, if we need to reach out to the township partners as well, and in the event that there's a question that we think they may be able to respond to um, in more detail, um, certainly I think we'll have, I know we'll have their, their cooperation as well. Um, so, and again, just to, to remind the, uh, the board, the reason that there are a number of reasons why um, we have, we're engaging Dr. Grip to, um, to do a new study. Um, one is a look back, you know, where are we today based upon where Dr. Grip expected us to be um, some years ago when he initially did it. That's an, that's an important thing um, for us to understand. Um, recognizing that um, at the time that the first study was completed, um, the, the COVID pandemic was not on his bingo card, right? So uh, as it was not on any of ours. Um, so, so likely some of, the pro, some of the projections and expectations um, are not, um, have not been realized as expected. And um, we would need to understand where there are differences, if there are differences, um, are they, uh, were they pandemic related and what can we do um, to continue to close those gaps. But um, perhaps more importantly, it's to ensure that we're in a position um, two, three, four, five years down the road to, to efficiently allocate resources um, where they belong and where, where they will be needed in the future um, with regard to demographic changes, population changes, population shifts. Um, and that's not just numbers, um, but it is also subgroups of, of populations and um, where we will need to identify the best ways to use resources to effectively um, serve those, those uh, populations, not just the ones we have today, but the ones that we'll welcome in the next several years. Um, and and we've, we've said this before, it's, it's one thing for us to expect that uh, most of the, the growth in Cherry Hill is likely to continue to be on the west side. That's where there's still more space. That's where the high, high density um, apartments, condominium complexes continue to be built. Um, you know, that makes some sense, but we, as we always do, rely on the experts um, to provide us the information and guidance so that, so that our, our decisions are thoughtful. It's not just what we expect um, it's not just histor it's not just historical changes. It's what what do the um, what do the expert demographers believe is going to happen? So that's the reason we're doing the study. Um, again, it'll it'll uh, commence in January, and, and we do fully expect to be in a position to uh, supply whatever additional information he may need or his team may need um, as he moves forward. 
Um, next is the communications audit. Um, clearly, you know, not just a hot topic now. Uh, it, it always has been. Um, it's been uh, it's been an Achilles heel, frankly, um, for a long time. Um, communications and and sometimes, um, not just sometimes, always. I think it's it's our obligation on the board to try and recognize what um, what's working, what's not working. Uh, if it is working, what can we do to enhance that? Um, where can we expand on on communication practices that are effective? Um, where what do we need to do to identify communications practices that are not working the way we think that they should work or the way that we think they are working? Um, and similar to the need to uh, employ an expert to do a demographic study, we're doing the same. And thank you to um, uh, to Barbara for um, for identifying um, the group that has been um, that is respected and is, is valued by many districts throughout the state um, to conduct a communications audit. Take a look at what we do, what we have done, what are our assets, um, where are we. Um, perhaps not taking advantage of things that we that we can quickly. Um, what what sorts of opportunities are there to improve? What groups are we reaching well? What groups are we not reaching well? What groups are we not reaching consistently? What uh, what avenues? What opportunities are there to to enhance uh, more engagement? Right, communication is often seen as kind of a one way, right? We'll communicate out, the district will communicate out and they may, may use, and they do use multiple platforms to do that. Um, you know, I think we've all heard plenty of um, examples of, uh, of district events, start times, stop times, half days, um, you know, that, that are communicated out in various platforms by various stakeholders, whether it's on the district website or a, or a PTA individually may do it which is not affiliated with the district or with the administration, uh, but there are partners, right? We need, to, um, we need to understand that just getting information out and knowing that we have put, or the district has put the information out isn't always enough. Um, is, it, is the communication audit, audit will help us identifying um, where there may be gaps and how that information is received, how it is um, consumed, and what can we do to improve that? And how can we provide for better opportunities for the very stakeholders, community members, parents, students, staff um, to respond back to us so that there's more real engagement. Um, and in so doing, um, hopefully reduce significantly, uh, if not eliminate as much as possible, um, false narratives that that unfortunately will arise if if certain stakeholders and groups don't think the information is out there or cherry pick certain information that gets, you know, spun out of control. And then there's a, you know, a new information narrative monster out there, which is just simply not true. Um, and unfortunately, as we all know, and it's frustrating for everybody, um, we as a board are not in a position to, or, and often really not permitted to respond in real time to some of those things. So the communications audit um, is, is important, again, because it'll give us the experts' view of what's working, what's not working, what can we do, how can we help um, ensure that the conversations and the engagements are productive, um, that challenges are met, that, um, that, that we are in a better position um, to not just inform our stakeholders, but also be engaged with with our stakeholders, and and the, so the 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 recent discussion that we just had on the parent schools, great, you know, it's really a good opportunity to. It's a great example of of what happens when information is just not. It's not understood. Um, I think all of us at the board recognize that that policy, and 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 Mr. Green, you know, thank you for for the, for the detailed explanation. That policy is not controversial. The policy is one hundred percent required. That policy is a federal requirement. Every school district, every public school district in the United States is required to have it. It's required to allow students and staff to practice their religion um, during school hours. Hopefully again, you know, with, with as, as you know, limited disruption to their own schooling as possible, but school districts are required to provide that. So the fact that we, um, had a first reading and that that became a thing 
um, and then a second reading, and it's become a thing, is it's unfortunate. And it's unfortunate because the communication isn't as isn't what it can be. So, you know, hopefully, uh, once we're through the audit, um, we can we can take back the recommendations that we'll get, um, and and we can move forward so that in the future, you know, those sorts of of information gaps, I'll call them, or misunderstandings, um, can be addressed and prevented. So we're not in a situation of having to explain something as though you know, we're doing something that we shouldn't be doing when we're not, we're required to do it. Everyone's required to do it. Um, that's just one example. Last thing um, I'll, uh, you know, I'll touch upon with regard to, uh, to communication um, is also, I think, you know, Mrs. Elmore Stratton, you know, said it really well, but it, it uh, there's a huge communication element as well. Um, it is not just the board's responsibility, I think, to support the staff. Of course, we understand that, that it is, but to communicate that as well and to communicate our support and allow the staff to have an opportunity to communicate their concerns, their needs, whether that be um, through the LMC um, at the building level or otherwise. And we want to find ways to make sure that, that is, um, that's happening and it's happening every day and at every school um, so that we can do that. And um, that will go a long way, we hope, towards ensuring that we can retain the excellent staff that we have. Um, and while this may be a little bit of a tangent, it's still communication. Um, I was thinking about this just as, as a few of you were speaking on some of your updates. Um, and it, and it, it's definitely an, an, a communication and excellent staff piece. Um, last, at the end of last week, you know, while while touring a um, large university in the desert southwest of our country, um, we were checking in for our our senior at Cherry Hill West. We we're checking in for a tour. The student who was who was handing all the check ins at the time um, noticed that I was wearing an Eagles jacket. Asked you know if I was really from the Philly area. I said Cherry Hill, and his eyes lit up. He's a Cherry Hill East graduate. Um, and so he, he talked to us for a couple of minutes about his experience at the school. Of course, we wanted to hear that, but, but what struck me, and he was effusive about this, was how um, excited he was upon, you know, beginning his college studies to learn that he, he felt he was better prepared by Cherry Hill than virtually everyone in his classes. He described himself as a good student while he was at East, um, but, you know, nothing stellar, and this is, these are his own words, um, that he took his classes seriously, he loved his teachers, but he didn't think too much about education until he started getting great grades in college. Um, and I mentioned at the time, of course, well, you know, I'm glad you hear it because you know, I'm on the board. And he did something which, you know, we don't hear often, so I'll communicate it to all of you. Um, he said words that, you know, we don't hear. He said, thank you. Um, not just to us, not just to the board, but to the staff, to all, to his, to, he focused mostly on Cherry Hill East, but he said, you know, it wasn't until I got here and I was competing against kids from other schools, other parts of the country, that I didn't realize what a uh, New Jersey and a Cherry Hill education meant. And he's on the honor roll now. Um, he is in the honors school. He's doing wonderful things. We don't communicate those successes enough, right? We talk about issues, which we should. We're here to, to, to identify issues, identify challenges, fix those. We don't talk enough. We don't communicate enough about the great work that our staff does every day. And these kids are so well prepared. Um, and um, that, that stuck with me. And as you were you know, talking about some of these other issues, I felt like, well, this actually is relevant to communication as well. Um, Timing of the communication audit, similar to the demographic study, that's going to commence in January. Um, and similarly, we will be in a position, we understand that um, they have what they need. They're not going to be waiting on us. Um, we'll, we will respond quickly if they need something else. Um, and as we get some updates, if there are interim updates, certainly we'll, um, I'll report those out. Finally, um, Dr. Rood, um, I was going to turn to him on a sustainability committee update. He is not here to do that, unfortunately, but 
I'm happy to announce that uh, Mrs. Gallagher has um, uh, g g uh, very gladly volunteered to join that committee. Hopefully that's still the case. Um, you know, there we, we, we each come to the table with, with, with passions, um, experiences, you know, things that are important to it, to us. And I know that, uh, Ms. Gallagher, that's important to you. We spoke briefly, texted briefly. Um, I was, you know, happy to see you wanted to join. Um, and, um, you know, the, the committee and the work and the mission needs, um, needs that passion. Um, we look forward to having you, um, you know, your views added and, uh, you know, look forward to helping move that forward. So any, um, any questions and discussions on any of that? Mrs. Stern. Thank you. I just want to, um, just for point of information to clarify. So at re we'll have our reorganization meeting on January 2nd. And at that meeting, that's when our leadership will be decided. And then it is the board president who will, you know, assign committees. So, you know, there that may, so it's good to know there's interest in a committee change. Um, so just as a- I just, let me, I, not, I'm not breaking the rules here. Um, this <laughs> this sustainability committee that Dr. Rood, this is a separate committee. It's not part, it's not- Oh, okay, committee. sorry. I just misunderstood. Thank you for as clarifying As a counterpoint that. of information, <laughs> again, I'm still on the good list. Not naughty or nice. Okay. <laughs> uh, ironic Ms. to come from me to you, right? <laughs> uh, or not. Um, Mrs. Winters. Thank you. I just wanted to touch on the demographic study because, as you may remember, when I was on the other side of the microphone, I read the original Dr. Grip study like it was my personal quest. And I had a lot of thoughts about how out of date I thought it was even back then, because it did not accommodate for full day kindergarten. It was only half day. And I believe I was very exuberant in my thoughts about it. So I just want to thank the committee for working towards what I think we're all working towards, which is data-driven decision-making that is systemic. Because I think that's something that was missing from my perspective for a while. You know, we tend to, sometimes a crisis comes up and it feels like we're playing whack-a-mole with limited choices in the moment when we have to solve a problem. And I think this is a really great step of looking at, again, to your point, Mr. Mayor, it seems to be common knowledge that the growth in the district is on the west side and that very well may be true, but we need to quantify that. And we need to look at where is the growth on the west side and what does it look like five years from now? That way we can make a plan and look at systemic changes so that we're allocating resources and students in the best possible fashion. Um, there's been a lot of talk on PNL about our elementary schools and whether they are crowded or they are not crowded or overcrowded or class sizes. A lot of um, conjecture and anecdotal information, which is good to have because it's the beginning of the conversation, but it can't be the end of the conversation either. I think once we have the data, then we can start to look at our school system as a system, all 19 schools, and also our incoming preschoolers, which will add another layer of complexity to this as we move forward for planning purposes and hopefully have a thoughtful plan to allocate things where they need to go. Um, that's a conversation I really look forward to having. And then also to touch on a little bit of what Ms. Stern said previously about special ed class placements for um, those sections. That's another piece where I think the demographic study will be helpful because it should be driven by the students' needs as always, but we also have to look at where do we have space to put classes and where does it make the most sense to cite those classes based on the demographic trends that we see. So I really think that doing a new demographic study now um, in this new post COVID world, because as you point out, COVID was a, was a huge crisis point that nobody saw coming and you can't plan for that. So now that we have settled in, I know there was a lot of movement in and out of Cherry Hill people who maybe had to be closer to jobs to commute are now able to work from home and are selecting our community because of its reputation for an excellent school system, which we love. But that probably changed some of the projections that were given prior to the COVID pandemic happening. So I just really think that the information that we're gonna get from this is gonna help us begin to think in a systemic way about a couple of the larger problems that we've identified as a board and hopefully begin to use that data in a thoughtful manner to really plan for the future so that we're not 
having to see things come to a crisis point and then react with limited choices because we have limited time, but rather look at how do we, how can we look at things three years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, so that there's systemic thinking about where we need to allocate things. Do you know, is there a timeline for when we'll receive the information? Oh, it's going to start in January. I'm looking to my left for a reason. <laughs> I expect it to take at least a couple months. I know, um, you know, he does have some information because he has already worked in the district, but I think that it will take probably, I'm going to guess three, three and a half, four months until we have it. Thank you so much. And when I was reviewing the information coming out of strategic planning, I saw some of the other districts that he's worked with and how they've used that information for these purposes too. So I'm really excited to see how we can do that going forward. And I really thank you for taking the strategic planning committee in that direction. I appreciate it. Yeah. I want, um, and, and, and that bottom line is what, what you finished with that, um, you know, we, we, we're often in a position where we, we do have to react to things and things may happen that we don't expect. And, and that's, you know, it's always going to be the case, but um, in order to be effective truly and to be effective in years on by, we, we need to be in a position to um, know what's coming and allocate resources appropriately so that we can proactively address those and have things set in place in the event that we need to shift later. Uh, and again, it's, it, it's all about data. It's not about what we expect. It's about what do the numbers say? Where are the subgroups going to be? How can, we, how can we use resources, money, space, staffing effectively um, to address those changes um, down the road? And then to tie that into your communication piece, I think part of the struggle that we ran into around this time last year when we were talking about you know, the middle school's redistricting process was that the community didn't, they felt that they didn't understand the decision-making process. They didn't understand the data, the numbers underlying it. So I think that twinning the demographic study and that information with the enhanced communication piece coming out of the communication audit, I mean, I think part of it is that sometimes it's hard to show our work in an effective way up here, but we can definitely better at that. And then hopefully even if people disagree with the decisions that I make as a board member, which is accountability, and that's what they should do. They should absolutely hold me accountable for the decisions I make and the things I say at this board table. That's what I was elected to do. At least I'll be able to say, these are the data points we looked at. This is how I see that data. This is why I made that choice. And like I said, people are absolutely free to agree with me, disagree with me, hold me accountable. But I think if we're showing our work a little more on that level with actual data, not just conjecture of, oh, I heard from somebody that there's all these kindergartners now that are coming into X school, or I heard from somebody else that Y school has this many kids in a classroom. Those enhance our understanding from a people perspective, and that's important to hear those anecdotal pieces, but I think it's also to, important to have the underlying number so that we can really get a grasp on what's going on and communicate all that out so that the community, as they're discussing the merits of what we do or what we don't do and how we decide things, they can, we can show our work at least as a starting point, as a factual starting point for, you know, this is why we made the decision we did and then have people give us that feedback of, yeah, but you forgot about this piece of it. Or, oh, okay, that makes sense to me now. Maybe I don't love it, but now at least I understand the thought process they went through when they got there. Mrs. Elmore Stratt. Yes, so I want to just add to that. And, and, and Ms. Winters, you spoke about people moving here because of the schools and just the flip side of that, that I would caution us to also take into uh, consideration is that if our lack of uh, dedication to the resources and the things that are needed in order to achieve our goals that we've set out each year, um, we're going to have to spend some dollars. Uh, and so, and the flip side of that is not people moving here. We, our achievement gap data, and I, I just have to say, I really hate the whole phrase achievement gap, but uh, that gap data, that's going to be significantly impacted in ways that we didn't project because now we're having more transiency happen in our township that we've had than we've had before. There's a larger number of apartments here. There's apartments that I don't think Dr. Grip even knew was going to come up. So, you know, we've got to tackle it from both sides. The folks that are moving here that want to be here because of the great schools, 
and then the folks that are leaving. And that's the same thing as I've said, just with the hiring retention. And one other piece I was gonna add, so thank you, Ms. Winters, for bringing that up. One other piece I was gonna add as well um, is, is in terms of the longevity piece. The, I love the strategic planning, thinking, forward thinking, um, because another piece of our forward thinking is also going to be making some strategic plans that also address uh, the top of the salary gap, the salary uh salary scale. Um, there's going to be room there for us to, There's there needs to be room there for us to grow um, and so that we can not only have longevity, uh, but also keep people from leaving us to go to another district that offers longevity and things like that. Um, so I just want to add that, that little note. And, and then Ms. Winters also, I love that you brought up the point about um, communication in terms of how that can affect each committee. I think without me sitting at this table, I can probably guess that the the audit is going to show we don't communicate well, we don't communicate enough, we're in very siloed uh, district, and that's crazy for a district that is a $200 million district. So again, just another piece where I say that LMC work has to continue because that is going to be our baseline functioning for agreeing to what happens with our district and making sure that all players are at the table. Um, so I just, I just wanted to add that in as well. And it's also one thing that's really been helpful for me is, and I know I've said it here before, um, but moving forward in terms of us getting to where we want to be with uh, achievement, with all of that, we are going to have to all agree on what the processes and routes that we're taking, despite whatever the result becomes. And again, the LMC, that, that's what's happening in real time. And they're making those adjustments, course correcting, they're establishing what that process is gonna be, whether they like it or not. And then they're gonna move forward with it to make, uh, make sure that impact is made because they all have one goal, which is to improve the educational quality of what we are offering our students right now. So, Mrs. Winters. Sorry, Mr. May, I don't want to steal your thunder, but I just wanted to respond to that a little bit, just from a different perspective, because I maybe I'm realizing as we're having this conversation that maybe I need to be a little more explicit in how we use data-driven decision-making on, on CNI because there was a narrative I was trying to put forth over the last couple of meetings and maybe it didn't land. So we had conversations about the NJSLA data. We had a beginning presentation here, then we had an in-depth committee discussion and that presentation was put on the board's website and shared out with the community. Within that presentation, there were data-driven recommendations made by administration for how we thought we could best tackle the things that we saw that we needed to improve. Also, what do we think we're doing that makes sense that's helping to move our district forward and further support? So one example of that is Ms. Stern pointed out one of the things we added in the budget last year was an additional administrative position to separate um, the curriculum supervisors for math and science. It used to be one individual who was grades K through 12, math and science. The recommendation out of admin was that we split that into two positions to do that better. The fruit of that decision, investment budgetarily and decision-making is that now we have a new math science supervisor who focuses on secondary on six through 12 and who's helping lead us through the math pathways that everybody loves so much. So that's sort of following that thread through. The same thing when we're talking about the high impact tutoring program that we pursued state funding and now leading into the dis discussion about increasing basic skills teachers. That came out of NJSLA data that showed that we had some opportunities to improve in late elementary school and early middle school. That's why we're targeting those grades three through six because that was that data-driven decision-making process. And I, if I did not show my work appropriately, I'm, I wanna just emphasize that all of that work that we're doing is driven by the data. And lastly, just one last piece of it, which is really part of what you're saying about the LMC and having people's voices be heard. That was why when Mr. Greenbaum asked me for recommendations out of CNI, I emphasized the work we did on the kindergarten survey. Because honestly, I think the absolute worst thing we could do is to ask people what they think, have them tell us what they think, 
and then not do anything about it. I feel like that is the biggest mistake we could possibly make. So if we're surveying kindergarten teachers to ask them what they think about full day kindergarten, and by the way, the results of that were overwhelmingly positive. The most positive results I think I've seen over 90% in many categories, people were satisfied. That's because there was a kindergarten curriculum committee that took input from people, created the full day K program, we implemented the program, now we're surveying them to see how is the program working. We take that data and we go back to the beginning of the policy cycle and we reevaluate, this is what's working well, how can we improve? The one major recommendation, food for thought we got was to think about, do we need more ed assistance in kindergarten classrooms? I don't know the answer to that. I don't, I don't, I, I am not the educational expert, but I think our job here as a board then is to take that, we ask the kindergarten teachers for feedback. We need to take that feedback and have it inform our decision-making budgetarily. So those are the kinds of things that, and I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir here because Ms. Elmore Stratton, Ms. Stern, and Dr. Root are all on the CNI committee, but that's the kind of data-driven decision-making I'm trying to bring to that committee as well as both long and short-term strategies to impact achievement. So short-term strategy, high impact tutoring, intensive this year, we got state money to do it. We see the problem, we're attacking it head on a long-term strategy is preschool. It's not divorced from this conversation. It's something when we talk about who are the students who are struggling to access the curriculum, right? Who are the students that we see who could benefit from accessing a high quality preschool program and what are the impediments to their access? And maybe it's because that program was half day, tuition based, limited, all of those things. Well, here's an opportunity to increase access so that when they get to the K curriculum, they're ready. And as they move through their academic years, we will see the fruits of that investment because the gains that they are going to make in that preschool program will follow their trajectory all the way through high school. That is a strategy. That is an investment today that we may not see that impact for years from now. So that's part of it too. I, I think sometimes the short-term thinking is, well, we want to, we want to change everything right now so that we see here's a crisis. Let's change 12 things to try to fix it. Did we fix it? But some of these strategies, especially when you're talking about children who are human beings, who are learning and growing and changing, sometimes you don't see the results of those investments immediately. Sometimes it takes a long time to see. When we changed, we asked about it last week, seventh grade, we detract two of the seventh grade math classes. And I asked, do we have any data on whether that worked or not? The answer is not yet. We're still, we're learning about how that works. And a lot of times that's the way things are when you're dealing with small humans with flexible brains who are learning things. You know, this is not a, a factory in which we put out widgets. This is a community in which we educate children to succeed in all the different ways that we manifest that success, not just standardized test scores, all the ways kids succeed. So this is sort of my, when we're talking about data-driven decision-making and maybe I, I, like I said, I tried to tell a story over the last three committee, the last three board meetings and maybe I didn't explain it well enough. That's that's what I've been trying to do. And I see all the committees trying to do that. And I think as we pursue the communication piece that strategic planning is putting together, we will be better able to communicate that out to the community so that they can, again, we show our work. This is our thinking, this is what we're doing. And they are free to agree, disagree, hold us accountable, but at least then they'll understand why we're pursuing the things we're pursuing. I did not pull basic skills teachers out of the sky. <laughs> I took it from, these are the scores I saw. This is what I understand. This is what was recommended to me. This is why I think it makes sense. Absolutely. So. I think you're just co-signing everything I said. Well, yeah, because yeah. I agree with everything you said all the time. <laughs> trusting that <laughs> we're, we're trusting the, the experts and we have to trust them all the way through. We can't pick and choose which pieces we say they're experts in and then say, oh, but we know better because of the data. The data is a great thing that that can dictate our our movement and drive our, our how we move forward. And, and I always say data will dictate your documentation of what's going to happen next. But we still have other pieces that are out there. And so the Labor Management Collective, uh, it focuses on support, promote benefits, uh, of offer of funds, provide mentorship and forums, reflecting, learning, collabing. We have to do it. But I, I think it starts at this table too. Um, and we've done well with it over the last three years. And I 
really hope that that continues because that's the only way that we're going to see the success impact that you just spoke about the years down the line. All right. <clears throat> Let's go to our action agenda, special action agenda. And with that, I'm going to ask uh, Mrs. Winters to please move the CNI uh, agenda. Sure. The superintendent recommends and I move the following. 17.1, approval of attendance at conference and workshops for the 23-24 school year. 17.2, approval of professional service agreements for the 23-24 school year. 17.3, approval of professional service agreements for the 23-24 school year. And 17.4, approved evaluation models for the 23-24 school year. Do I have a second? Ms. Fleischer, are there any questions? Ms. Sugars, please open the voting. Board members, you may cast your votes. The motion carries. Mr. Greenbaum, can you please move the business and facilities agenda? Thank you. Uh, the superintendent recommends and I move the following. 18.1, approval of bill lists. 18.2, resolution of the Board of Education of the Township of Cherry Hill in the County of Camden, New Jersey, accepting preliminary eligible cost determinations for certain school facilities projects and authorizing other actions and connections therewith. Do I have a second? Mrs. Winters, uh, are there any questions? Yes, there are. Uh, I'm gonna start by answering one that I've received uh, probably three or four times. <laughs> Uh, and then I will open it up to the rest of the board. Um, so one question that has come up a number of times that even came up a few weeks ago in uh, fair funding committee meeting was how much will this cost? This is 18.2. It has to do with our rod grants for preschool construction. Uh, how much will it cost? What's the state share? What's the local share? Uh, where are the funds for the district share coming from? And I'm going to take one more step and tell folks where you could find it. Um, so the figures are provided in the three attached documents that are embedded in the agenda, uh, item 18.2. Uh, the state will cover 40% of eligible costs and the district is responsible for the other 60%. Uh, so I'll give some round numbers here. You can dig into the agenda if you wanna look at specific numbers. Uh, but for the Mel Melbourne Classroom Edition, uh, the total cost or preliminary eligible cost for the project is 6.25 million. Uh, Kilmer Classroom Edition is 6.55 million. Melberg Bathroom Edition is 1.5 million for a total of 14.3 million for these projects. Uh, the total state share is 5.72 million. That's a little bit higher than we expected to get with the grant. It's like 20,000, but we'll take it. Uh, and the local share is 8.58 million. These align with... Uh, what was estimated when we did our budget discussions back in April. Um, the district share was allocated out of capital reserve funds uh, when we approved the budget. Uh, this is on page 12 of the public hearing budget presentation uh, that was shared publicly on April 25th. Um, our local share is actually 30,000 less than originally estimated. So, you know, it's not a huge amount, but it's always nice when we come in a little bit under. Um, I don't believe this presentation was shared out as a document, but you can take a look at the recording of the board meeting on April 25th. It's right in the beginning under administrative reports, uh, or it's also available in the user-friendly budget on the district website, although not broken down in quite as much detail. And I think that answers that question. So I will go back to the rest of the board. Uh, are there any questions? Just do I was I think the last question I had because I had asked these questions just so that because and then Mrs. Neary asked the same questions as well is that adding the um, twenty thousand nine hundred square feet um, what does that increase annual maintenance cost for the space for the district? Sure, so I'll give my my best guess answer. Uh, I will ask Mrs. Sugars to fill in the blanks if she has any additional information to add. Uh, but based on the preschool expansion aid application, the per pupil amounts specified uh, are intended to support both the direct cost of serving children in the classrooms and the district-wide oversight of the program. 
Uh, there is additional information on eligible costs that can be found in the budget workbook instructions on page eight of that application, which you can find on uh, the New Jersey Department of Ed website. Um, any additional maintenance costs, I believe, are still likely to be determined. Mr. Sugars, do you have anything else to add to that? It's somewhat hard to quantify. I would say that we are probably going to have to consider hiring additional custodial help. Thank you. Uh, any any other additional questions? Mrs. Winters. Not a question, but I am unreasonably excited about the new bathrooms at Melbourne <laughs> toilet rooms. <laughs> Having had three children go through that building, some children who had a, a toilet in the classroom bathroom and some who had to go down the hall for that, I can attest that it is really challenging to get a group of preschoolers to go down the hall to the bathroom. So I hope that this makes the lives of the staff in that building a little bit easier. And I'm really glad that we were able to capture state funds to do that for them. I mean, talk about something that affects them on their day-to-day -day basis and will make things easier in that building for them. I think this is one of those things that seems maybe a little bit silly, but I'm hoping will have a good impact on the way that they do the work. Okay, thank you for that. And any other questions? Okay, seeing none, Mrs. Sugars, please open the voting. Board members, you may cast your votes. From no one, 18.2. Okay, the motion carries. Okay, we move on to human resources. Um, Mrs. Elmore Stratton, can you please move the HR agenda? Absolutely. The superintendent recommends, and I move the following, 19.1, termination of employment shouldn't have been said because there's none at this time. 19.2, termination of employment non-certificated. 19.3, uh, appointments certificated. 19.4, appointments non-certificated. 19.5, other compensation certificated. And do I have a second? Mr. Mayor. Are there any questions? Comments for the good of the order. This okay. is a question. No, not a question. Just um, I want to also, since we are now voting on it, and they have, haven't voted on it yet, but we're about to, and I assume we're going to, it's likely going to pass. If it doesn't, that's okay too. But uh, I just want to really congratulate um, uh, Janet Cohen, Mrs. Cohen. Um, she is a huge support to us specifically on the board as well as obviously uh, Dr. Morton and the entire district. Um, I know we have many, many months till Mrs. Cohen actually retires. <laughs> so she's kind enough to give us lots of time. Uh, so, um, you know, I know Dr. Morton already is uh, working with Mrs. Cohen on um, transition plans, but uh, she's a, an enormous asset, um, the consummate professional and uh, been very helpful to me since day one that I joined the board and even before. So Mrs. Cohen, I do think you're so on and I just want to thank you for everything. Anything else? And I'm sure we will find a way to celebrate Mrs. Cohen once she officially retires and you guys have my number. So invite me to that. Um, <laughs> okay. So are we ready for the vote? Any other questions or suggestions? All right, Ms. Sugars. Board members, you may cast your votes. And the motion carries. Thank you. Okay, we have no items for strategic planning, so we move on to new business. Oh, and I skipped policy and legislation. <laughs> Thank you for keeping me on my toes. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mayor, uh, Mrs. Fleischer, can you please move? I'm really off my game, right? I was think looking at strategic planning. Mrs. Fleischer, can you please move the P&L agenda? Sure. The superintendent recommends, and I move the following, 20.1 approval of harassment, intimidation, bullying, investigation decisions. 20.2 second reading of policy P5111, eligibility of resident, non-resident. I'm guessing so. That's the only one that's up. 
I'm sorry. I have a question. Um, are we just passing that one tonight, Mrs. Wellington, for the second reading, even though the other ones were on our agenda? I just realized. I'm just realizing. I think the other ones were on for second reading. Just give me a, a minute, Mrs. Okay, Wellington. thank you. I appreciate your help, Mrs. Wellington. Sorry, I didn't realize that. Yes, I believe they should be on for second reading. Mr. Green, any advice? Well, if they were not on the agenda, they could be they could be moved tonight if you wish, but they can also be moved and, and acted on at the action meeting. So it's up to the board. In terms of that, I, mean, I would suggest at this point, since they were not advertised on the agenda, as I understand it, that it's probably better to do it at the next meeting. Okay. So the the um, second policy readings that were on that during that we discussed during our committee portion will be moved next week, right. and we're just passing this one right now. Okay, right. so I'm going to just reiterate what we're passing, if that's okay. Um, so the policy um, I'm moving the uh, following. Let me find where I was. Sorry about that. I'm moving 20.1 with the approval of harassment, intimidation, bullying, investigation decisions. And the only one we're moving tonight for the second reading of the policy is P5111, eligibility of non-residents, uh, residents. residents. Um, do I have a second? Mrs. Stern, any questions? Seeing none, Ms. Sugars, can you open the voting? Thank you. You may cast your votes. Ms. Sugars, I'm going to say uh, no to 20.1, but yes to the rest. Ms. Sugars, I'm going to vote no on HIB 254927. Yes to the rest. Two five four nine two seven. And the motion carries. <clears throat> okay, back on track here. So no items for strategic planning. And so we now move on to new business. Do any board members have any new business? Mrs. Fleischer. Thank you so much, Mrs. Stern. Um, good evening, everybody. I want to share a personal decision. Um, it has been an honor and privilege serving as a member of the Cherry Hill Board of Education. And as you know, my husband, Dave, was just recently elected as Cherry Hill Mayor. Given that dynamic, I'll be stepping down from the board effective December 31st of this year. It has been an honor serving on this board, and I'm proud of what we all have accomplished over these past two years. Thank you to the public for your confidence and your support, and I remain optimistic about the future of our schools and community, and I look forward to working with all of you in different capacities in the days ahead. Thank you so much. Do we have to accept that? I mean, can we just say no, we're not gonna accept it? <laughs> um, so Mrs. Fleischer, I do feel the need to comment and just tell you, um, you are a true leader on this board. Um, you are an incredibly collaborative team member. And I really, really appreciate your dedication and hard work. Um, you know, I we've known each other a long time. And um, when you were elected to the board, I was really excited to serve with you because I've seen your leadership um, in other areas. Um, but I had no idea um, how much. I had no idea to what level your leadership would really um, how, how far it would really go. And in, in the sense of, I, I just didn't know you in that way. We knew each other in other ways, more socially, um, I would say, and through PTA. So, um, I'm from the soccer field. <laughs> so I just want to say how much I'm going to miss you. Um, and I want to thank you so much for what you've done for the board and for this community in this district. Um, you care so much about these kids and it really shows in all your involvement on the board. 
Um, so good luck to you and your next venture, whatever that might be, and um, and to your family. Thank you so much, Mr. Sternlip's words mean a lot to me. And I'm not going anywhere. Obviously, you all know <laughs> our family is here to stay in Cherry Hill. You'll be seeing a lot of us. So um, I'm looking forward to new adventures with everything and being collaborative in a different way. So thank you. Okay. Any other, actually, no, no more new business. No one can, no, I'm kidding. Okay. Any other board member new business? Okay. Any board member old business? This is Elmer Stratton. I just want to, again, um, kind of circle back in terms of what we talked about. We were going to look at our special education programs and see if there are things that we can do at the board table in terms of helping. And I know that th there's been a, a huge uh, push for having more at each building or having uh, programs at each building. So I guess it's sort of new business, sort of not, but that's another thing that I think we didn't touch on as much as we need to, but perhaps a conversation specifically surrounding that in terms of how we can move the needle, because that's going to be like, uh, you're going to need twice as many teachers, forget just the spacing as the aspect of it, but you're going to need twice as many teachers, specialists, behavioral supports. Uh, and it, again, without going to that, to that uh, 2%, we're not going to be able to do it. So Any other board member old business? Okay. And with that, we move on to our second public comment. This is the second public comment section during which you may comment on any school related topic. If you would like to speak now, please clearly state your name and municipality. We will alternate between speakers here in the room and those who are online. Each speaker will be given a maximum of three minutes to speak. The timer on the screen will indicate the amount of time you have remaining. Public comment, uh, and I should say we will alternate between, we already said that, sorry. Um, I do want to also say if there are students in the room or students online who wish to speak, we always allow our students to speak first. If you are in the room and you would like to speak, I would ask that you approach the podium first you don't have to, but I would encourage you so we can get out of here and possibly do homework or get some sleep. Um, if you are a student and you are online and you'd like to speak, I would ask that you please put an S after your name online so that we know you are a student and can call on you first online. Public comment is an opportunity for the members of the community to comment on matters relevant to the operations of Cherry Hill Public School District. With or within the authority of the Cherry Hill Board of Education. The board welcomes diverse opinions on relevant matters. Under established federal law governing reasonable restrictions on speech and public forums, statements which demean, malign individual community members or groups or are irrelevant to the operations of the school district or repetitious will not be permitted. Community members who would like to present information not relevant to the school district are always welcome to communicate directly to the district superintendent, board president, and all board members via email or other alternative means. Okay, so if you could please state your name, your municipality, which is the town you live in, right. um, and then uh, you have three minutes. All right, so my name is Jacob Gona. I live in Cherry Hill, and I'm a senior at Cherry Hill High School East. And I just wanted to address the increased amounts of Islamophobia since October 7th, obviously. As a Muslim student at Cherry Hill East, I don't feel safe because the potential dangers and atmosphere that it's riddled with Islamophobia has can bring someone like me. I know that like some days I didn't feel safe coming to school because I might feel like I've, I could be like attacked at any moment. I know I skipped some days of school because of that also. And like, especially like converting to this religion, like fairly recently, like a year ago I converted and it's just like difficult for my parents as well, because my mom doesn't know like what's gonna happen to me when I go to, when I walk into school or something. Cause she's really worried. <laughs> uh, I think that it just like if you guys maybe can come up with something that can uh, like diversity training. Like I know during sophomore year, I had 
a course on um, microaggressions. And I feel like that really helped like the school because I know there are a lot of different problems with um, racism and stuff going on in school. And I feel like that helped a lot. So I feel like if you guys could implement something like that again, it could help decrease these amounts of Islam, like these reports of Islamophobia that you guys are receiving. Because I don't know, if, I, I feel like you guys don't want to talk. Like, they hear this every week, but like, it, it's really something we're pushing towards. And I hope that you guys can do a good job and like try to implement something. Just thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you. Now, um, Looks like we don't have any students currently on the line. So it looks like we have another student. So if you could please state your name and your municipality. Yep, uh, my name is Noor Raja. Uh, this is the third time you guys have seen me. Again, I was in one of, well, I was one of the students in the Hate Has No Home Here uh, video, which uh, I can never be more proud of the my fellow students that were included in that. And the whole point of that video was just to show that we accept all, well, the not just East, but Cherry Hill as an entire like district should accept all and should discriminate against none. However, after that video, I still am hearing, you know, a few a few cases of, you know, my fellow Muslim students getting called terrorists, getting called bombers, getting called all these hurtful names that as a as, as a Muslim student, as as a human being and as a Palestinian, I, I it brings me up some anxiety. You know, personally, I've not gotten called any of these things but before the video i have but after the video i'm still i'm still hearing a little bit of um of racism and like my friend over there has said i really really would love if you guys would like implement a you know a, a course or a you know some teachings about how to accept it have how to accept islam and to great teachings of islam about how beautiful the religion is me of course being a proud muslim does not need to uh, learn how great the religion is, but however, need to be more accepting of of uh, Islam in general and knowing that Muslims are not bad people. Where I'm, I know I know a good amount of Muslims. You know, my mom over there is you know great lady. You know, appreciate your mom. Yeah, and me me being as a student and being raised from as long as I can remember to love everyone and accept everyone and to appreciate everyone. You know, ba you know judge people based on their actions, not their you know their color their skin, the content of their character or their religion, I find it a little, uh, I, I feel like an oddball kind of when I hear my community getting, you know, labeled with such terrible uh, names such as bomber and terrorist. So I'd very, very, very appreciate it if you guys would think of, you know, a curriculum to like implement in the schools where we're more accepting of all, not just, not just uh, against Islamophobia, but against any uh, ideology that uh, is against any race or any type of people, you know? So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so no other students in the room, I believe. So now we will go to the line and um, it just says iPhone. So I would ask you to please state your full name, first and last name and your municipality. Yes, Laurie Neary, Cherry Hill. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank Mrs. Fleischer for her service to the board. I'm very sorry to see you go. You were a very thoughtful, deliberate, and reserved board member, which I very much appreciate. So we are very sorry to see you go, but wish you all the best and Mr. Fleischer all the best. Um, second, I'd like to um, speak with regard to the communication audit um, that Mr. Mayor referenced. Um, I can tell you with certainty, this is not the first time it's come up. It's been a long standing issue for the board and the community. Um, we do a lot of communicating, but we're not really sure of its effectiveness. And just last week, we failed to communicate, uh, you know, a reminder of a big change and shift in the calendar. It wasn't on our district website. It wasn't on the district calendar. It didn't go out on the district Facebook page and it didn't go out in the weekly email reminder on November 22nd. And it was that change of a half a day last Thursday because of holidays, there was a shift in the half days that affected 15 schools. And it's wonderful that our PTAs communicate it as a courtesy, but it's an accountability of the district itself to make sure that parents were reminded, a robocall, a blast, email out to parents 
we of all people, <laughs> former board member myself forgot we had been sick after the holiday. My son was not the only one sitting at the school waiting to be picked up. Um, and we could have so easily addressed that. Um, so it's it's definitely a, a gap. And I, you know, it's great to do an audit. I don't think we need to do an audit to know we have a problem. Um, so I appreciate that, you know, that's being looked at and hopefully action very soon. Um, and also, you know, speaking to, you know, I know what, you know, <laughs> folks think when my husband and I speak and we know we are not necessarily broadly well loved, but we come up every time because it needs to be said. And we're a small group of a handful of parents that come up and, and speak on behalf of what's really not a small number of students. It's the size of some entire school districts, but we keep doing it. Um, so when we talk about teachers being maligned, so are parents. And we've got to remember that memes making fun of parents, you know, posted by PTAs, um, not OK. And we need more positive engagement, especially at the elementary level. I'm sad that evening concerts in the winter are gone when just seven years ago we were fighting for it. I'd like to see that come back. My, my youngest is not getting the experience my oldest had. And that's sad. Thank you. Okay, and we go back to the room. And if you could please state your your name and municipality. Thank you. My name is Amina Ahmed. I'm uh, serving as the Muslims for Justice Advocate, which is for GCLEA, a organization here in Cherry Hill. Um, I wanna start off by thanking the district administrators for cons their consideration and taking time to understand our concerns. I wish I could, if you'd like, you can start the timer. Um, if I wish I could, or you could dock me 30 seconds, whatever you think is fair. Um, I wish I could take uh, a full three minutes or even more to express our deep appreciation. Um, and really that was my intent. Um, but I, you know, as things unfold, I feel that there is something I need to bring to your attention. Um, since Wednesday, two incidents happened at Beck Middle School. Um, I don't expect that you know the details of those incidents um, yet, but um, I, I think it's important that you know that, that things are still happening. Um, in one incident, a student was in an elective class. This happened on Friday about four days ago. Another student walked by and yelled something to her, which can be interpreted, I mean, very clearly. I'm not going to repeat it because I don't want to raise the tensions in the room uh, as an anti-Muslim comment. Um, she looked at over to, towards the teacher, which a student should do when something like that happens. But And um, the teacher was within earshot, heard it, and she said, is that okay? Aren't, aren't you gonna say anything or something of that sort? I'm not quoting her exactly. And the teacher turned away. Um, we, I believe this is one of the topics that has not yet been clearly um, addressed, maybe partially addressed, but the peer-to-peer -peer harassment. Um, I understand there's thousands of students in the district. Having been a school teacher, I know you can't control everything that comes out of every student's mouth, every action that's done by them. However, two to three incidents per week, at least the ones that are being brought to the attention of youth, um, uh, people who work with youth and community centers, um, that, that's not a rate that should be acceptable to a school district. Um, the problem really simply is that there is a chain of command by which students can report an incident, but that's after the incident occurs. What our students are facing is on a daily basis, they feel very anxious going into school, especially those who are clearly visibly Muslim or Arab or Palestinian. Um, they, don't, they don't feel that mental emotional safety that is the basic right of every student. And I know all of you understand better than I do because of your years of experience that surpass mine, that student achievement and positive student outcomes are directly tied to social emotional well-being. So we're here basically, or at least I'm here, I, I can't speak for everyone in the room, but I'm here to di directly ask, what is the plan of action so that tomorrow morning, not weeks from today, but tomorrow morning, Students can go to school, students of all backgrounds, and, and have that basic right met even in this political atmosphere. Thank you. Okay. 
And then we go to the line. The phone number is 788. You please state your name and your municipality. My name is Jeff Powderwitz, uh, Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Um, ex, um, I'm ex, this is an excerpt from, um, the, from, from the complicated history behind BLM solidarity with the pro-Palestinian movement. June 12th, 2021, NPR, you can hear it on NPR. Just go um, to it. Um, me, Dr. Padowitz, I'm sorry. I, yes. I, you need to speak to something that is relevant to the operations of our That is relevant because it was discussed last meeting. It was reading brought up article, last. Reading an article is not is not going to is not something that this is. This was um, brought up last you meeting. Use okay, your you're stopping me. Oh, you're stopping me. And then I'm going to talk about policy on two two seven zero. Since you stopped me from talking about it, religion in schools. Please vote no on the revision. Since you stopped me, made to this policy at this time. Say no. The statement. Made the board of the, the board must provide the certification New Jersey Department of Education by October first. That's not valid. If you if you go to the state's website, what you're going to see is is that you, that it has to be the, the you have to send something to the New Jersey DOE by July. By July, not October. I don't know where that, that came from. You could go to that website. Why does the administration want to make major changes in, in this policy? There is a large difference in stating applying the governing constitutional principles verse and changing the wording to applying constitutional principles. This change is basically telling us as people that our administrators will apply what they determine are constitutional principles, not what the governor, governor, governing principles are. If we do not like it, then we'll have to sue them or file with OCR, um, U.S. DOE. But, you know, uh, but our leaderships do not seem to care about people who, when they file for, for U.S. DOE, they've, there have been a number of filings over the last couple of years. It doesn't really, it doesn't change behavior. That's the administrators, people, not the teachers. Not talking about the teachers, criticizing the administration. The Supreme Court has repeatedly recognized that schools have a special interest in regulating speech that occurs under this under the supervision, where speech is where, where speech materially disrupts classrooms or involves substantial disorder. A disorder or in the invasion of the right of others. So school officials may impose reasonable rules of order. That's not in, 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 in your policy. That's the key. And it is up to the discretion of our school administrators. However, I, I, you, uh, that's what I'm trying to say. So there are major changes. In it. Two, what people have to know is, Dr. is Potter, that. Your time is up. Thank you. Let me go back to the room. Good evening. I'm Jen Nadio of Cherry Hill Township, and I'm here on behalf of my husband and myself as community members and parents of a super senior adult in and out of district placement. My husband is home with our son, couldn't join me, as I felt it was important to be here for our comment. We want to remind all of you that these are our First Amendment rights, and if they are violated by the board by not permitting me to speak, as they have done to other community members, we will post our statement in many locations. We've been watching the board meetings, preschool presentations, election endorsements, and committee meetings. Based on our observations, we are concerned about some of the Board of Education members and their recent actions and the way they're purveying their understanding of their role. We are noticing BOE meetings are not following the form and function of a Board of Ed meeting, so we wanted to remind the Cherry Hill Board of Education of the 18A 12-24.1 Code of Ethics for school board members, subsection DNF, I will carry out my responsibility not to administer the schools, but together with my fellow board members to see that, that they are well run. I will refuse to surrender my independent judgment to special interest or partisan political groups or to use the schools for my personal gain or for the gain of friends. We're hopeful that the review will bring this board back to form and function and extinguish any overstepping of their roles as members of the Board of Education. Did you share with Dr. Grip that the district now has full day preschool? Last time this board didn't tell them, uh, tell him the district had full day kindergarten, let's not waste money on this. 
And in addition, we wish Mrs. Elmore Stratton and Mrs. Fleischer best wishes on their next journeys. Thank you and happy holidays. And we go to the line. Uh, I believe this is Ann Einhorn. Ann Einhorn, Cherry Hill, New Jersey. I just want to do um, a comment on the Pathways um, curriculum that was presented tonight. Um, my concern is that Pathways doesn't accommodate the students with IEPs. And these students do not have the ability to have a weighted GPA because currently they do not qualify um, for these courses according to guidelines within our schools and nor do they qualify for National Honor Society. They can't take AP and honors courses because they have an IEP. So how does the Pathways program affect those children? Because my concern is where is the equity and the inclusion when these, pe when these students currently are going to be excluded from the current Pathways presentation? These students won't be able to participate in the Pathway courses that were presented tonight. Systemic changes need to be made to accommodate these students now to have a more equitable situation for them. I would like to know when the Early Childhood Advisory Council will be formed and when you'll be taking applications from the parents in this community about the pre-K expansion. And when it comes to having to go back to listen to the April 25th to 2023 public presentation of the budget, that's fine and dandy, except we know that that's a modified presentation. So I would like to know where I could see the actual numbers in writing, or do I need to make an OPA request for that? Thank you. Okay, if you could please state your name and your municipality. My name is Alice Cobb Voorhees. Um, I'd like to start uh, with a big thank you to everyone. Uh, we applaud the steps initiated by both the faculty and the students to increase education and conversation in an effort to combat the rise in anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, racism, as well as other forms of hate. If we are to address the concerns of this community here today, we must talk about a history nearly lost, but not forget forgotten by many people, including some here in this room, the Farhud, uh, most people have never heard of it because it's not taught, but maybe it's time we start. Um, it's relevant today more than ever, um, and it would help us to understand our community that is here and how it's struggling with current events. Um, countries like Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq have more in common than language, music, and food. They were all home to large, thriving Jewish communities, much like ours right here. Where are they now? Gone. We urge everyone here to learn about the Farhud in 1941, the largest pogrom in Iraq, followed by the mass exodus of the entire Jewish population of the Middle East. Sorry, Ms. Cobb. I, th <clears throat> we th asked that topic, the board. Thank you. It was, please be relevant to our board, school district to consider adding, if it hasn't already, the Farhud to the curriculum alongside the study of the Holocaust. There's a difference between propaganda and history, and we need to teach it. Thank you. Okay. All right, and now we go to the line. It's Jennifer Sharman. Please state your name and municipality. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, hi, this is Jennifer Sharman from Cherry Hill. Um, I have a, a lot of things that I wanna say, but first some people that have already spoken have um, said so already. Um, and I agree with um, everything that they have said. Um, my, my concerns are um, a few. Um, first, I also agree with um, Ms. Stratton, actually with the um, maligning issue that you spoke of, um, Ms. Stern. Um, it starts with uh, our Board of Ed and our district. Um, the maligning that you guys show our parents and our um, community is horrific. So if you want to see it to be um, something better, um, you need to start by your own actions. 
Second, you mentioned a lot about climate um, issues that go on in schools. I was part, well, I was supposed to be part of the school cl um, climate meetings. I've been to two of them. Um, however, I have not gotten any further emails. I haven't gotten any more invites. I don't know if that's an, an oversight or intentional, but I would like to know what's going on with them and to be um, included back in the emails unless there's something that they're not going on any further, but I still hadn't gotten any notification that they were stopped. So um, that also brings to the communication, lack of communication that goes on with the school boards um, and with the schools and with the parents that needs to be improved upon. And in regards to the religion um, policy, I find it interesting that it's being brought up now, but I do have some concerns that um, if the students were to be accommodated, how many students at one time are allowed? If more than one religion, um, you know, a person that has different religions wants to pray, how do you, you know, um, separate them so that they can be respected, their, their religions can be res respected? And if it does start to affect a child's grade for leaving too much or during a test, how do you handle that? And, um, what happens, what kind of um, actions do you, or disciplines do you give, or interventions do you give to stop people from doing it in during lunch periods and hallways? Um, I'll give the time back now, um, but if you could answer some of those questions. Oh, one last thing. What do you guys plan to do with um, replacing uh, Ms. Uh, Fleischer? I'm sorry to hear that she's leaving, but I would like to know how you're going about to um, hire someone in her replacement. Thank you. Have a great day. Okay, and we go back to the room. If you could please state your name and your municipality. Uh, my name is uh, Janam Salem, Cherry Hill. Uh, I first wanted to reiterate what um, my sister here, um, Ms. Amina said. Uh, we certainly do thank the board administrators for hearing us, working with us. We really do appreciate that. Um, and something that um, Mr. Mayor said earlier it really hit me. And I mean, I had something else prepared, but I think he was right on point when you said that you had spoken to a former student who said they were better prepared. That's 100%. And you guys really deserve that um, recognition. My, my three older children all went through college telling me exactly the same thing. They were much better prepared for college than the other students in their classrooms. So that is 100%. And you guys actually really do deserve that recognition. I, I have to say that. Um, you know, Cherry Hill is, it, it means a lot to me. That's why I'm here all the time. I know you're tired of seeing me here every single time, but I'm here because we really do care about this community. And the fact that we're here all the time, you know, every single board meeting, we just want to make it better. And there are some issues, you know, um, I've heard from parents of other children that they are still getting harassed and still getting called these names. And we, as a community, are better than that. We just want to, you know, ask you guys to implement something, possibly the students, you know, among the students, just like my son had told you, if, if they had a better understanding, I think this wouldn't happen. You know, I've said this before, that if the students actually sat down with each other and spoke to each other and saw each other as human beings, that this um, rhetoric would not go on. You know, it's unacceptable that they're being called this in school. And, you know, children are coming in with anxiety and stress. And in this political climate, there is enough anxiety and stress that the students are going through without having to come to school and feel that same anxiety and stress all over again. You know, and I know one of the speakers online said something about, yeah, we do have a, a, a connection with the African-American community, a very strong connection. You know, me as a Muslim woman, I'm visible. So if anybody just looks at me, they know what I am and they have their preconceived ideas about me. As an African-American, they look at you, they know what you are, they have a preconceived idea. So we're just trying to stop that in the Cherry Hill schools. We really think that more education and more just sitting down with students one-on-one, -on -one, just talk to them as human beings, have mutual respect for one another, that would help a lot. And I think that would probably help eradicate the issues that are going on right now. 
You know, I just, we ju we're just trying to make the community better. And with your cooperation, I know we can. Thank and we you. thank you. Thank you so much. Hello, Rick, Rick Short, Cherry Hill. Um, you know, everyone around here is talking about hate, hate. And hate is like a disease, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and I just heard these uh, two students talk. And um, I don't think uh, the solution, Dr. Morton, to your problems with uh, that are happening right now are bus trips with uh, 40, 40 students and t-shirts. And then let's throw in 19 lawn signs. I don't think that's the answer. I hope one of you on the board might have seen the Dartmouth story on 60 Minutes. You know, it's about education. So when you're not educated, you end up in some crazy um, group, like the one that just happened. Because we're associated with uh, Black Lives Matter, we're teaching Black Lives Matter, and in our schools, it's a mandatory topic. So um, this is a poster from Black Lives Matter, which is just about 8.9 miles away. And it's no misinformation or anything like that. But they were part of a protest where they were out there yelling. Uh, Mr. Short, yes. please keep the topic relevant to the operations of the Cherry Hill Public School District, not about outside activities. Thank you. So. Huh. So I can't give examples of hate speech. Please and keep how the to, topics relevant to, to the operations of our school district. I know it. Well, well you, you, it sees right now that you have a problem with hate. And now you're telling me I can't give you an example to how to reduce hate. Now you've taken my time and you've taken what two other people's time because you don't like how I'm going to exemplify how to reduce hate. So how do you know what I'm going to say? President Stern, you don't belong as president of this. Mr. Short, would you please restrict your comments? The president is absolutely correct. Your comments need to be relevant to this school district. They, you they have are yet to, relevant you have to the yet school to district. identify a single thing here that is well, relevant to the operation how can of this you, Board of Education. I, because I you am. haven't said anything. You've put up a post. It's totally unrelated. Now, if you would like, oh, to it's tell not. Us, this is not would, related. If you would like to tell us how this, this Black relates, Lives Matter you would poster like is us, not related to the school district of Cherry to. Hill, New Jersey, which makes it mandatory to graduate. This Black Lives Matter poster does not. You've, Mr. Short. Yes. Please explain to us what the relevance is, because well, you have you've yet cut. To, I well, only have three ahead. minutes to speak. Go ahead. Are you going to? Are you going to? Tell give us what the relevance to, is. Are you Mr. Short, you have nine seconds to okay. finish how it's well, relevant. That, yes. This is stoppage of freedom of speech. Okay. Now we go back to the line. And it's Alana Yaras. If you could please state your full name and municipality. Okay. Alana Yaris, Cherry Hill. Um the winter concerts are coming up at the end of December and last year at Kilmer Elementary School there was a problem with the sound that was recorded for the winter concert and so my student who plays an instrument um, I was not able to see the winter concert because parents are not invited there is no virtual option for them to attend and there was no um, recording of the concert available to be seen. I have a fourth grader this year who's playing the euphonium, which is tuba for elementary age students. Um, she's the first euphonium player at Kilmer in the history of this music teacher being at the school, and he's been there for almost 15 years. And I'd like to be able to see her concert, whether that's through a virtual option or a recording. And I'd like to make sure that recording works and has sound. Um, I understand we only do daytime concerts, but if we can make sure concerts are available for parents to be able to see, that would be greatly appreciated. I like to support my children and the things they are doing. Um, the second is I attended the kindergarten information session at Malberg for parents of special needs students. Um, and the 
um, case managers and social workers who were in attendance at the program for the district went over all of the special ed programs available at the elementary schools this year. There are 12 elementary schools and only 10 of them have special ed programs, Kilmer and Barton being the largest two elementary schools farthest west in the district that do not have any special ed programs. And that means that any students who are zoned to Kilmer and Barton, and as you know, my family is zoned to Kilmer, um, who live on the far west side of town, the closest schools they can go to are Payne or Kingston if a program for special ed is offered at that school, and oftentimes it's not offered, and those students sometimes get bus to far east side schools, Bret Hart, um, Sharp, if the special ed programs could be looked at so that either programs can be offered at all 12 elementary schools or programs that are only offered at one elementary school could be moved to central elementary school locations so that all people who live everywhere across the district could be bused equally. So if you live far east or far west, you can be bused centrally located if a program cannot be offered at all elementary schools. Thank you. Okay, let me go back to the room. If you could please state your name and your municipality. Good evening. My name is Josh Anushkevich and I'm from Cherry Hill. Uh, I would like to refer to the race policy. Um, a few years ago when my daughter was studying in Rosa, uh, one day she came back from school very upset. At first I did not understand the intensity of the event and I was uh, quite naive that it was just a difficult day. Then, to my great surprise, while I was trying to understand what happened, she started saying firmly, Dad, I'm proud to be Jewish and I will never give it up. I have to say that we are not religious at all. Uh, so her reaction <clears throat> made me even more suspicious that something else happened. After some time, we were able to get her to open up. And it turns out that during the bus ride, a boy started making harsh anti-Semitic comments in a loud voice. I must point it out that the principal of the school, Dr. Guy, took it very, very seriously, and I do appreciate very much being my wife. I really hope that Do Dr. Guy managed to change the boy way of thinking and to make him to understand that he did that what he did and why he hated is so dangerous thing to the soul. I'm very proud of my daughter who refused to accept the role of a victim and, and very proud of her Jewishness. What I learned from this event is that no matter how beautiful and perfect everything, especially here, which is, you know, beautiful township, Cherry Hill, uh, Jew hatred is still alive and well, and therefore the school policy must also address the Jew hatred as it exists today in our community. Thank you. Okay, let me go to the line. And the name is Igor B. If you could please say your full name and your municipality. Um, hi, can you hear me? Yes. All right. My name is Danielle. I live in Cherry Hill. I'm a student. Um, I'm Danielle, online. I'm sorry. Could you just say your last name, please? Thank you. Borsutsky. Thank you. All right. Um, I've been hearing a lot of stuff about, like, uh, different communities experiencing hate towards each other. And I've also heard from, uh, I haven't had any personal experience recently um, of anyone like being hateful towards me, but I've had friends and I've heard things about people, uh, whether they be like Muslim or Jewish, um, experiencing hate. And I feel like talk uh just bringing up the situation like saying what happened to you i like when when the war in ukraine started um i speak russian but i have family in ukraine and i was getting comments about me speaking russian and i didn't like i didn't i could complain about that but i i didn't you know and i just feel like instead of having something implemented about just Islamophobia or just anti-Semitism, I feel like those terms, um, instead of bringing up those terms, we should just be taught like how to be a community, you know? I feel like the uh, 
Cherry Hill East and Board of Education for Cherry Hill has failed to unite the students. And I, I feel, I just feel like there isn't a community anymore. There's a lot of diversity, but instead of that diversity separating us, I feel like there should be something implemented to make us feel connected because of our diversity. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna go to the room. Please state your name and your municipality. Jack Brangan, uh, Cherry Hill. Uh, I have a request of the uh, CNI uh, group. In the uh, September 12th board meeting, they introduced and I guess approved a book called Red, a Crayon Story. And uh, it was described then as uh, a book about uh, being different, but being true to yourself, which sounded good. And a few days ago, I uh, just did a little research on it, and uh, I went to Goodreads to look it up. And it did fall under the category of picture books and children's books, but it also fell under the category of LGBTQ, queer, and gender. It's a little surprised because that was not mentioned at all. So I went, went over to Amazon and uh, to look at the ranking of this book. And it ranks pretty low, but its highest ranking was at number 99 in children's book in the LGBTQ category. And I also found out in uh, Mecklenburg, Virginia, it's uh, been taken off their curriculum because they ban sexual topics for kids kindergartens to uh, fourth grade. So apparently there's more to this book than uh, what was described. So my request is that we have the CNI group come back and sort of represent this and maybe explain how it might be falling under these categories. I think that the uh, people at Cherry Hill and the parents should know about that. That is really much more than the way it was explained. Also in the notes, uh, there's mention about the Rubicon Atlas, and I have looked at that, and that's pretty good, but it's the topics there are too general. So everything looks good from 30,000 feet, so there's not enough detail to really find out what's underneath each one of those topics. So in the notes, there is a mention that uh, parents may view materials used for the program, and I think that's what I'm most interested in. Uh, my kids are at a school district, but I presume this will hold true for interested taxpayers. So I'll probably be reaching out to find out how I can see some of those uh, materials. So thank you. And now we go to the line. There are no hands up on the line. So we go back to the room. If you could please state your name and your municipality. Sure. Good evening. My name is Maha and I'm a Cherry Hill resident and parent. I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead. Keep um, going. I recently read an article citing that Islamophobia hate related incidents have risen in New Jersey by 733% as of a couple of weeks ago. A number of incidents were reported in the local Cherry Hill system, um, Cherry Hill East in specific. Um, I will be honest with you, I was shocked. I could really not believe that was happening in our local school systems here. And this is why I'm here today because I thought um, maybe we can do something about that. Um, I was I actually browsed the web and I was encouraged to see that there is a cultural proficiency program established in 2017. In light of George Floyd's death, the school board moved swiftly to include anti-racism policy number 2100. Though this is a great start, there is a huge opportunity to improve uh, its implementation. In the previously stated policy, there is a responsibility for the superintendent to maintain cultural proficiency um, uh, equity character education advisory group, which includes community members, students, certified not and non-certified staff, administrators, and parents. Um, it is paramount to ensure there is a representation of all communities, including the Muslim community in that advisory group. After all, how could we combat Islamophobia if there is not anyone there on the table? Um, additionally, anti-Semitism and anti-racism policy outlines board commitment to adopt curricula that leverages reflect and affirm uh, the unique experiences and social, cultural, linguistic, and familiar background of Chair Hill School District community. I would, like to ask, uh, I, I would like to ask the board what effort was made to apply this policy towards the American Muslim community. 
what curriculum has been adopted that represents American Muslim culture experience in historic and modern day America? What curriculum explores the dynamic um, between the US foreign policy and its impact here on the American Muslim culture and experience in a manner, in a manner that, is for, that is both fair and accurate? The increase in the Islamophobia that we are seeing today in our schools is nothing but a gap of the board's ability to apply its own policy in a fair and equitable manner. Sorry. Uh, unfortunately, since the establishment of the Cultural Proficiency Board in 2017, there was not an inclusion of the American Muslim experience. Had there, had there been one, um, we might have been able to build genuine understanding and empathy towards diverse community. And maybe, just maybe, we might have a fighting chance against the media that is reporting Islamophobic rhetoric and painting Muslims with a white stroke brush. While we cannot control what's said in the media, we have the responsibility to equip our students with the tools and knowledge they need to critically analyze information and contextualize it rather than fall victim to misinformation. In closing, I would like to, um, uh, in closing, we must educate and come back to attempts to paint groups as others. It is because we start focusing on differences rather than, that, rather than humanity, hate is born. Thank you. Thank you. Let me go to the next person at the podium. I think you know what to do. <laughs> yeah, I've been here before. Uh, Annie McElvain, Cherry Hill. Um, quick shout out to Mrs. Fleischer and Ms. Elmore Stratton and to Janet Cohen. Um, I've said it to others uh, over time. Uh, anyone who deigns to serve on the Board of Education has both my thanks and my respect, um, and that's ongoing. Um, I've known Janet Cohen for close to 30 years, and uh, she's always been the same, and I'm sure she will continue to be involved in Cherry Hill. Time and again over the years, individuals and groups within our community have sought to divide us <clears throat> with their rhetoric in their own, for their own selfish interest. While the issues varies, the methods do not. They rely on bold-faced lies, innuendo, half-truths, and statements taken out of context to put forward a narrative of disadvantage to incite anger against the other. Do not be fooled. Their aim is control of a vocal minority over our community, our cultures, and the future of our children. The way to defeat them is through truth, honest debate, and consideration of all points of view. So if you see a post on social media that contains a screenshot to prove a point, try to find the source to get the complete picture, then use your independent judgment which we should be teaching to our kids from day one to assess the truth or falsity of what is being put forward. Uh, on a slightly different note, I, I had a political science professor in 1969 whose words still ring true to me. Beware of individuals who claim a monopoly on the truth. This is even more true today than it was in the 1960s and it applies to me as well as to anybody else. Uh, Abraham Lincoln said in 1858, a house divided against itself cannot stand. If we are not united as, if we are united as a community, we can do great things for the future of our kids. Divided, we cannot. I choose great things. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McElvain. Okay, if you could please state your name and municipality. Uh, David Berkovich, um, Cherry Hill. Um, I'd like to um, thank outgoing board members. Um, thank you for your service. Um, I am somewhat new to the community, but um, moved in over the summer, but I appreciate the work that you guys have done. Um, likewise, with um, all public service and all board members, um, I recognize how difficult, um, and echoing Mr. Mayor's comments earlier, um, just giving a general thank you um, to the board members. Um, and also to Dr. Morton, um, I, I was uh, present and at the last meeting where Dr. Morton specifically addressed some of the concerns of um, the Jewish community and some of the efforts the board was doing. And I just on a personal level, I, I appreciate um, a responsive board and um, you know, a board that, that appears to be listening to the community and, and taking efforts to um, address our concerns. And, and I, I do greatly, sincerely appreciate that. Um, 
I do want to highlight something regarding the religion policy that was discussed. Um, I, I understand where the board's coming from with the communication gap. Um, you know, as an attorney, um, you know, I, I feel like I have a different eye for policy and legislation. And, you know, my view of the changes to the religion policy didn't really raise any alarm bells. Um, so I, I, I have heard um, other members of the Cherry Hill community express concerns about the religious policy. So I do believe there's a communication gap. And not to um, call the board out, but um, I mean, the, guy, the communication wasn't great today. Um, to, be, to be technical, um, it's not a mandatory policy. Um, you know, if we get to the Constitution, um, states never abrogated education rights to the federal government. Federal government typically makes states and local municipalities do things by attaching tax dollars to it. So while essentially that does make it somewhat mandatory if you want to get federal dollars on a technical level, it's not it's not mandatory. It's mandatory if you want to get the money. And I, I just wanted to point that out. Um, and lastly, um, as I've said previously, I do believe the board should um, consider um, adopting prophylactic anti-Semitic anti um, policies to address it. Um, I, I believe the new form of anti-Semitism is um, not, Cherry Hill isn't insulated from it. And I think um, as a school district, we need to take efforts to address it. Um, we need to be proactive and we, didn't, we need to make sure that we're, we're teaching uh, not only our educators, but our students um, positive things and how to, uh, even something that seems innocuous could be hateful to some communities. And I, and I recognize that's not just the Jewish community. I'm a member of the Jewish community and I recognize it's true for other communities as well. Thank you, have a good night. Okay, we're going to wait for everybody else to have their first chance, if that's okay. And then I'll ask you to come at the end. I know you're a student and thank you for your understanding and patience. Hi, my name is Eric and I'm a parent and resident of Cherry Hill. Eric, I'm sorry, could just also say your last name, please. Yeah, Eric Ian. Uh, first off, can I just say those math pathways, truly fantastic. Uh, I personally would have been very excited myself to partake in the statistics, in the statistics track as an incoming student. Um, so I just want to say if multiple parents and these brave young students we saw today are coming to the board to share their personal experiences being discriminated against, this means the board has failed to provide an outlet for these parents to address their concerns. This only happens when parents and students feel their issues are not getting the proper attention they deserve. I'd like to propose the idea of an allied against, allied against hate committee, AAH for short, consisting of board members and school administrators dedicated specifically to these sharply rising cases of hate and bullying at campuses. This committee would work directly with administrators at campuses to receive reports of religious hate from students and parents directly via email, meet with the students involved, and hand out corrective action where needed in the form of suspensions and possibly expulsions. The board would then report issues and resolutions to the public. These students need to learn the actions of consequences in high school and society as a whole. Communication is sent out that the board is cracking down hard on religious hate. Students will get the message that their college applications and permanent school records will be held accountable for their behavior. This is the only action that will make students think twice before making despicable, despicable statements, like calling their fellow students terrorists. There is no place for that at our schools, period. In 19, when school like that was racking up, the board outlined a plan to address students owing $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $10, $
Um, you all have seen the show for the past few weeks. Um, we are here not just to express indignation, but we actually genuinely are an investing component of this community, and we want to see a holistic district that represents the interests of all of our students, whether it is through prayer or food. Uh, and on the topic of food, something in the agenda that I think Ms. Gallagher brought up um, was the fact that this district is requesting RFPs for food service providers. As some of the people on the board may or may not know, Muslim students have uh, often religious restrictions. So I just wanted to raise the point that as we are entertaining RFPs from food service providers, uh, the board make an effort to entertain uh, service providers who are able to accommodate different religious diets, whether it's halal food for Muslim students, uh, kosher for Jewish students who observe, or vegetarian or vegan diets for Hindu students, um, just any provider that is attuned to those needs. Um, and um, a larger point, um, as we are kind of engaging with the board, we just ask for a more holistic view on the different topics we discuss. Um, we are not just one issue people. Um, in, like, for example, the uh, prayer issue that comes up in school, as Muslims we pray five times a day. We're not trying to hold conventions or anything in school, just trying to meet religious obligation. Um, and as we've presented numerous times, we do have community partners who are willing to engage with the board members on a personal level. Um, so we just encourage the board to really consider these efforts in this diversity, especially as we are agreed with the loss of this threatened from the board who has, as we've seen today, been one of the most vociferous uh, voices um, for diversity, and we just encourage the rest of the board to maintain those efforts. Uh, and just as a last point, um, on board, uh, I guess, meeting the forum, um, we just, we uh, um, are appreciative, or I'm appreciative that the board has been enforcing the forum in these meetings and refraining from inflammatory remarks. Um, but we also just ask for equity and that we stick to guidelines. According to guidelines, my colleague Moore here is a student, uh, um, he should not have been limited. He should have been the first person to speak, whether in public comment in the first or second session. So we just ask for equity across the board, which we acknowledge that the board has been doing as great of a job as they can given the circumstances. Thank you so much for your time. So we are going to take the next two speakers and then we will be finishing our public comment. And the students not had a chance to speak. So I'm sorry to the student in the back. We, we, we yeah, we need we we need to we need to be able to be equitable in our application of our public comment. So I'm gonna to go to the next person to please approach the podium, state your full name and Miss Cal. Hi, all. my name is Bonnie Cohen. I'm the junior chair here. I heard everybody here and I all the time hearing negative stuff, hate and stuff. I, I do believe that the way you think is the way you feel. So it's good that we all hear, but it's better if we all go home and talk with our kids in a positive way. How can we change it? How can we accept each other and respect each other? I do believe that it all started at home, so we need to be better. And the parents, we all parents, and we need to sit at home with our kids and talk to them, you know, and to solve this problem from the root. It all started at home. I have a kid, I teach my kids to accept and love everybody regardless of his color, the language he's talking, whatever he's eating. I love everybody, we're all the same. We need to start to work better in this issue. As for another issue that bothered me, it's as a student that drives his car to the high school, I don't understand why he needs to pay for parking spot. As for today, I believe $50 fee, a student needs to pay in order to park his car in the high school. Am I right? Like, it would be nice if I would get a little feedback. This is another issue that I mentioned before, that open dialogue will be better in this and more proactive in this meeting. But I will really appreciate if the board will consider it just to waive this fee from the student. I don't think that student that drives his car to school need to pay $50 fee in order to find a parking spot. I think it's ridiculous. We are paying a lot of taxes in Cherry Hill, and it should be covered. This is what I think. Thank you for your time. Final speaker, if you could please state your full name and your house. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Zainab Ozdener. I live 08003 Cherry Hill. 
I just wanted to um, give my support to board member Elmore Stratton. Um, I completely agree that teachers stay where they're valued. So I'm a physician and I, I, I really, I'm actually a pediatrician. So I really, really connect with teachers. It's really, really, really hard serving the current young generation. They're very different. <laughs> and I think it's because we're dealing with something completely new. These kids are growing up with technology that even millennials didn't necessarily have. Um, so the behavioral problems are a lot more, um, especially with like special needs kids. I understand that not all of the Cherry Hill schools offer um, special education. We, we want to attract high quality teachers. We have to pay them more. Uh, and I know that might be very wishful thinking. I know the president was saying uh, we have to stay realistic, but uh, this is something worth pouring money into, just like the preschool is worth pouring money into. So, and I know it's easy to say and suggest like apply for grants. And I know you guys are doing a great job, you know, finding money. Um, but I, I just really wanted to second, you know, her amazing ideal of, pay and value the teachers that really like they feed the next generation sometimes parents like the speaker before me I'm very sorry I didn't catch her name but she made an amazing point it really does start at home so if parents like speak negatively and they maybe use racist language their kids are gonna too um because they, they don't know better you know like they need to be taught so sometimes parents can be giving their kids technology that they don't they shouldn't be having at 18 months old, you know, you shouldn't be looking at any, anything guys, kids below two, I'm just going to do my little pediatrician insert, <laughs> please don't give them any technology. But unfortunately, parents do give their kids screen time. So and then these kids come in to preschool. And then these new teachers that we're going to be taking to do full day preschool are going to be ha having to deal with that. And really, excuse my language, but that hell of like a kid who's used to being constantly stimulated. This is a huge challenge. And these kids are very young right now. So when they get to high school age, God knows what new obstacles we're gonna be dealing with. So um, definitely attracting talent, paying talent well, and just valuing the teacher's opinion. I just really thought Ms. Elmore made an amazing point. Sad, sad to see you both go. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to say that. Anyway, good night. Thank you. Okay. And that is the end of our public comment period. And I will now turn it over to uh, Acting Superintendent Dr. Morton for comments. Mrs. Stern, I don't want to, I, I want to make a comment just as Oh, a, I'm sorry. So Mrs. Elmer Stratton, did you want to speak at the podium as a, yeah, as I, a private citizen? Private, if you'd like me to do that. Um, I think if you have a, sure. if you want to be part of public comment. That is great. So I asking you to speak from that podium as a because you may have personal comments rather than at the board table. So sure. So timer. Mrs. Sugars thought we were done. So. Thank you, Mrs. Sugars. If you thank you. Well, is there, it won't be three minutes anyway. Uh, Corinne Elmore Stratton, Cherry Hill. Uh, I know I'm here right now speaking just as a private citizen. And I, I want to first applaud everyone at this table in terms of the commitment to the work that is done and to the diligence of everyone really making and ensuring that they're doing uh, quality service. At the same time, I urge and implore the the people at this table and the people that will soon be on this table to put some more safeguards around our children when it comes to these uh, opportunities that people come to our public meetings in order to use our platform for their personal views or their personal political views. It's upsetting that students are being recorded and placed onto spaces with tags on them uh, that are really hateful and incite what the other young man uh, spoke about in terms of violence and them being hurt. And as a private citizen, I sit through these meetings. However, when I go home, my private self is crying, driving home because we're moving so backwards in terms of where we are as a school district and a community. So as much as we're taking steps forward, we're taking two steps back. So 
you, I, I, a couple of things that have always been brought up, cultural sensitivity, that's happened years ago. C bringing together a committee to speak on things, that's happened years ago and currently happening now. Uh, we have done this before and I feel like we have learned nothing. And in terms of just uh, the things that have been happening in the past few days, as a, a, a mother of someone that did graduate from Cherry Hill East, uh, I am appalled that we are at this point where students don't feel like they can go to school and be safe. And um, I just really would like all of, all of you as you move forward, number one, look back at what we already did and see if that worked and then assess where we are, but also look at who you bring to the table and look at who is allowed to participate in these conversations. Hate has no home here video happened four years ago and we're doing it again. The students are repeating because of our failures. And now me, someone 40 plus years old, I'm still young um, and I'm sitting here and I'm having flashbacks of things that happened to me as a child in this district in terms of my race and my nationality. So I really, really need for you all to put in some protections, look back at what's been done before, bring others back to the table to help if it's necessary, but do not let this fall by the wayside because way too many people are being hurt unnecessarily. Thank you. Okay, we are officially finalizing closing of public comment. We are moving on to um, acting superintendent, um, Dr. Morton's uh, superintendent comments. All right, thank you very much, Ms. Stern. So as a, as a community, uh, again, I thank everyone for coming out and speaking tonight. I think um, someone said it well and communicating their love for the community and their passion for the community. And that's why we see the representation that, that we do. Um, you know, if, if you think about uh, uh, socialism and, and how we socialize as as uh, as individuals, it's our individual responsibility to create the reality that we want. Mm -hmm. We we are the community, and whatever we, or however we behave, however we choose to interact with with one another, creates the reality by which we have to live. So if we're dealing with uh, issues of strife and volatility, in many instances. Is we have to look no further than look at ourselves. We're, we're creating that situation. If we're not creating it, we're helping to do something about it to improve conditions. So I think, you know, as challenging as it is to hear some of the, you know, contrary situations that people are dealing with, it provides us an opportunity to reflect and to do something different about it. Incidents that are reported at a school, there's a system of checks and balances that exists. Our Board of Education, Board of Education are the governing body for our district, but Incidents that occur uh, must be reported to the administration at the school. So if, if there's something that happens, they have an obligation and a due diligence. Our principals, our assistant principals, they have an obligation and due diligence to respond on behalf of students. If a response is not met satisfactorily or does not occur, the system of checks and balances that we, we, we rise up the level of concern. We have assistant superintendents. We have an acting superintendent. That the system itself has to be implemented and we, we ensure accountability. We have to make sure that we activate that system though. If a teacher, if there's an assumption that a teacher's heard a comment and the teacher has not responded accordingly, I can't speak to the situation. I, I don't really know what, what may have happened or what may have been heard, but the appropriate step would be notify the administration and there's a response. Everything that's been, uh, the administration has been made aware of, they have responded to. Um, we are unable to discuss specific discipline with individual students uh, if, it's, if it's someone other than one's own parent or guardian. But I can, I can assure you and I can tell you there is appropriate discipline that, that is instituted and that does take place. It's just a matter of communication and making sure we communicate things. Uh, as I mentioned last week, we, we have staff training beginning next week for the staff of uh, High School East that will be focused on the new face of anti-Semitism. Um, in January, we're, we're lining up training around eliminating bias and building cultural literacy in our schools with a focus on Islamophobia. 
education, awareness, and information is what's important for us. So we want to start with our faculty. Our faculty has responsibility for ensuring the safety, uh, not just physical, but emotional safety of all of our children. So, so we start there, and then we, we'll begin to, to work from there as well. Um, just a couple cl clarifications as well. Pathway courses uh, will include accommodations for students with special needs. If students have IEP needs, we are required to ensure that we are uh, that we meet those needs. Uh, we we will ensure that um, really the intention of our pathway courses are, are to provide greater equity, greater access, and, and, and greater opportunity for our children. So so we'll make sure that um, that IEP needs are met. Uh, winter concerts this year will be recorded, and those recordings will be shared with families. Um, we are also looking to um, bring back spring concerts as well and have families come back into the schools for, uh, for spring concerts. We, we absolutely have the most outstanding uh, faculty and staff, I believe, in, in all of New Jersey. Um, and as evidence of that, I'd like to congratulate Erica Connolly um, from Carusi Middle School. She was awarded the Ruth Tour Outstanding Media Specialist of the Year Award by the New Jersey Association of School Librarians. We also had the librarian from uh, Kingston, our media specialist, Anna Hankinson. Uh, she was awarded and received the Billy Ga uh, Gandhi Award for Excellence in Technology through the same organization as well. Uh, one of our CNI supervisors this year, Violetta Kat Katsikis, actually was the New Jersey Principals and, and Supervisors Association Supervisor of the Year for the entire state of New Jersey also. Uh, so, you know, we, we continue to be proud of our faculty and we continue to be proud of the job that they do and supporting our children. Um, Janet Cohen is a rock star. She's an absolute rock star. You know, it's, it's hard when you lose your rock stars. <laughs> it's hard. Uh, we have two rock star board members as well. Um, who we, we greatly appreciate and will we'll miss also. I, I just want to personally say thank you uh, for all of your effort. Um, it is late. I had a few other things, but I'll, I'll reserve them. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Morton. Um, so I got a chance to make some comments um, about Mrs. Fleischer and Mrs. Elmore Stratton. I don't mean to draw further attention to you but I just want you to know um, how much I'm going to miss you, um, how much I've grown because of you, um, how much I've enjoyed collaborating with you, um, and you know, also on benefiting from your leadership, your approach to team, and your honesty. You're, thank you. Thank you for multiple years of service on this board. Very thankless, often service, but nonetheless, you, you carry on and you persist, so thank you. This was my chance to thank you, so I wanted to make sure I got to do it publicly. And with that, I may sh make a motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Mrs. Winters, all in favor? Motion carries, meeting is adjourned.